the county commissioners here. I want to welcome everybody to our June 22nd uh, Board of County Commissioners meeting. Um, we have a pretty full schedule today, so we'll, without further ado, we'll get uh, right into it. Um, uh, we're going to first start with an invocation by Kimberly Massey from the Prayer Tower Church of God in, in, um, uh, in Christ in, from St. Petersburg, and then uh, Commissioner Flowers will lead us in the pledge. If you'll stand, please, and join. Pastor, go ahead. Grace and peace, all. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Precious, gracious Father, Heavenly Father, we seek your presence for this people, for this great Pinellas County. Lord, in this meeting, we seek your wisdom. We seek your peace and your prosperity for our leaders, for every decision, and for everyone great and small in this county. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Okay, today we have um, uh, a few presentations, and Barry will introduce those in just a minute and, uh, and give a summary of himself of, 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 the, of, the year, of the year that was, and I'm looking forward to hearing that. Um, before we get started with that, though, I did want to have, we have one proclamation for National Mosquito Control Awareness Week, and I'd like to ask Alyssa Barrow, who's the Interim Mosquito Control Section Manager, and Craig Warren, who's a mosquito control technician too from our public works department, to come up here and, and join me. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. I'm going to read the proclamation and then we'll take a picture and then the microphone will be yours. Okay. Mosquito borne diseases have, have historically been a source of human and animal suffering, illness, and death in the United States and worldwide. Excess numbers of mosquitoes also diminish enjoyment of the outdoors, public parks, and playgrounds, hinder outdoor work, decrease livestock productivity, and reduce property values. Public education and awareness of the health benefits associated with safe, professionally applied mosquito control methods will support these efforts as well as motivate the public to eliminate, mos uh, eliminate mosquito production sites on their own property. The, mosquito, the American Mosquito Control Association is sponsoring National Mosquito Control Awareness Week in an effort to increase the public's awareness of the activities of the various mosquito research and control agencies within the United States and around the world and to highlight the educational programs currently available. The efficiency and morale of the qualified and dedicated personnel who work in the mosquito control program are influenced by public attitudes and understanding of the importance of the work that they perform, and now therefore be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that June 20th to the 26th of this year will be recognized as National M Mosquito Control Awareness Week. So thank you for all the work that you all do. All right, I'd just like to thank the board for all of your continued support and your recognition of our hard work during National Mosquito Control Awareness Week. 
I know that our mosquito control team is really proud of the hard work that they put in, and I'm especially proud of the, all of the dedicated work that they've put in over the past year with all of the challenges that we've all faced. They've been really committed to making sure that we've protected public health for the community, and I'm especially proud of them. I also wanted to just say a special recognition for Mr. Craig Warren, who I brought with me. He's one of our mosquito control technicians. He's not only dedicated his time to mosquito control uh, during his normal uh, workday, but he also spent a significant amount of time at one of our vaccine vaccination sites uh, in the county and volunteered his time there to help uh, keep those organized. And I want to thank you, Craig, for all the work that you've put in for public health, both for mosquito control and uh, overall. Thank you. Thank you. Alyssa, where, as residents, where are the maybe top two or three places around our homes that, cre that we create problems that we need to be aware of and take care of? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so one of the first ones that I think of that I think a lot of people may not think about is if you have bromeliads. So bromeliads are a plant and they have um, a, what's called a tank in the center that collects water. They're very beautiful plants, but that water that collects is perfect for mosquitoes. We actually have a container breeding mosquito, Aedes aegypti, our little ankle biters that um, <laughs> are actually very dangerous. Those ones are the ones that can transmit dengue and Zika. So they're especially important to control. Uh, so the big thing with bromeliads is flush them out once a week or you can use BTI and that product is available at any uh, local home improvement store uh, to be able to control those mosquitoes in there. Um, one of the other places that I think people uh, maybe forget about is think about your bird baths. Um, those ones, if you just scrub them out once a week, always a good thing. And the last thing I will say is for those ankle biting mosquitoes, they love all of the containers around your yard and that's exactly where they want to inhabit. So just look for that standing water. If you're getting little ankle biters, encourage your neighbors to look, look around yourself and it'll go a long ways to getting rid of some of those mosquitoes. Right. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank Anything, you. any other question? Alyssa, Craig, thank you so much for the work that you do and pass that along to the folks that work with both of you every day. I will, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Um. All right, Barry, why don't you go ahead and start us off. We'll ha we have a couple recognitions here in a minute and Barry will introduce those as well, but I think he also wanted to summarize a little bit uh, kind of what's gone on this past year. Well, commissioners, um, as we got, we have a couple of awards that we're going to uh, discuss later on, and that's both for both uh, the chief judge talking about all the work that our facilities and uh, real estate folks worked on during this past year. There was also an award given by the Florida um, City and County Management Association, and we're going to, uh, again, present that. But prior to presenting that, I, I, and because both of those really talk about the teamwork that went into surviving and dealing with this past year, I thought it'd be good for kind of us to recap that. Um, you know, if you think back, you probably think back three, four, five months, but this began 16 months ago. And when we start thinking back, we remember a time when you come together and, and looked at the first uh, um, emergency order. What, the steps that we took since then on both the front line and at a policy level is, is really remarkable. Um, we talk, talk about public service and people going beyond for something that they've never done before and trying to figure that out. A lot of them are here today, but one of the first things we did, and you're well aware of that, is, is establish our executive policy team. Our executive policy team, including Dr. Cho, Dr. Jameson, <laughs> Sheriff Galtieri, Lorda Benedict, Jill Silverborg, Tom Amate, Kathy Perkins, Dr. Greco, the fire chiefs, we had a couple different fire chiefs during that time, come together and we talked every day. We talked about how to collaborate and how to figure out what the best thing to do with situations, again, that you had never faced before. So if we kind of recap back in the first quarter, January to March of 2020, the virus begins to spread. We established our executive policy team. We also established our rock calls with all of our community partners, trying to share information and try to make sure the lines of communication were open. We began talking about a regional PIO network, um, public information network, where our, our, all of our um, public information officers were sharing. But at that point, 
is really where things began. We began to build out with our appointing authorities and our city managers working groups to try to have everybody collaborate to bring action to the things that needed to occur. The EOC went into full activation last March, and as you know, we, we just come out of that. We established 13 working groups, including a fire and EMS group, a hospital working group, behavioral health working group, homelessness, a business working group, public information, nursing home, and long-term care facilities working group. We had a, and, and some of the things that we don't think about, a finance and purchasing working group, community feeding, fatality management, a data management, a community well-being. All of these groups were made up of not just county employees, but, but community partners from around Pinellas County that didn't look at it as a jurisdictional issue or my responsibility or yours. They looked at it as a problem that needed to be solved. And so the, these dedicated people come together and with the leadership and support from everyone, we began working together. And I will tell you one of the best examples is we were collaborating on an issue and I don't even remember what the issue was. But we were on a city manager's call and I remember Bill Horn saying, okay, you've taken everybody's input, now make a decision and we'll all follow. It wasn't about that jurisdiction or this jurisdiction, it was about we, we need to be a team. We need to act as one voice and we need to respond as one community. And, I, and, and that's what we saw throughout this entire past year. We are so fortunate to have community partners like that. Um, I just can't say enough about everyone's efforts. As we look back, you know, we, we, we saw our feeding operations set up. Nonprofits began helping people at record levels. We had behavioral support networks, emotional support lines, regional edu education campaigns. Um, then the world PPE shortage began. We couldn't buy PPE. Our economic development team worked with local manufacturers who stepped forward and, and produced our own shields and other types of PPE to help keep our both our, our first responders and our residents safe. At one point, we had three warehouses we were operating, distributing over 9.5 million pieces of PPE uh, throughout the year. Our fire and EMS started transporting nursing home pa patients. Remember that? When they were lined up down the block because all of a sudden we had infection outbreaks within our nursing homes. Our, our EMS started to transport. What did our firefighters do? They stepped forward. They started inspecting and did over 4,000 inspections within our, our long-term care facilities and talking about proper infection control, getting needed PPE into the places it needed to be then and modifying our operations to respond to this pandemic. Come Memorial Day, um, actually, let's go back. <laughs> Remember spring break <laughs> and the commissioners, rightfully so, I didn't even want to do that at the time, said, we, we cannot have the beaches where we're at. And we ask our law enforcement to step up and close our beaches. Never, never have we seen a situation like that, but we did it. And it allowed us to kind of regroup and prepare for what's to come. Then Memorial Day came around. We didn't want to repeat a spring break, but we also knew that things had to change. And so we worked with the sheriff and, and all of our community partners to come up with a safe, way uh, a, a social distance beach day and and who can uh, uh, nobody can forget the uh, um, the beach capacity dashboard that the sheriff created um, that was an amazing tool but wow what I mean talk about a law enforcement effort um, that was an amazing display of, of law enforcement coming together to be able to have people spread out to where they can enjoy the beach we started receiving CARES funds. Well, anytime now we get into finances, we look at human services and economic development, our finance team, our budget team, and many, many other staff working behind the scenes to set up paperwork, drafting contracts, reviewing guidelines to not only try to get the funds out quickly, but to also make sure we complied with federal regulations regarding the use of those funds. We made, we made changes along the way. That was certainly not perfect, um, um, but, we, but we got it out and we awarded $55 million uh, total award uh, to businesses and another 24 million to individuals. All payments went out to families uh, to figure out, you know, uh, that were impacted by our economy. Uh, those struggling to make payments on utilities, we modified our operations to give people time, set up payment plans. 
and so, so many other things. Um, as, as all this, you know, and all this endless effort occurred, remember that people were still providing sewer and water and 911 calls and all the day-to-day -day operations that our county government does. In total, um, we ended up distributing over 250,000 face masks. Um, then we got into things like setting up testing sites. Originally, it was the testing sites. And then uh, earlier this year, we started expanding into vaccine sites. Um, we, we implemented things like the Rise to Shine campaign, trying to, again, people to, that come here to be safe. Our rapid testing at the TROP, our, all of our volunteers, these are volunteers throughout the county that staffed all of these different programs. Our fire and EMS step forward again when we ask them to, to set up our vaccine sites, you know, beginning in, uh, early in January. Uh, the Cedar Oral Portal, we got off to a rough start, but we regrouped and we, and we made a portal that worked. You know, and um, and we were able to distribute. Um, uh, I'm losing my numbers, but two, over 250,000 vaccines. So, you know, I, I I'm not hitting everything that's occurred, and and no way can I thank every every group, entity, and person that stepped forward, except to collectively say it wasn't Pinellas County. It was Pinellas County government working with a community that truly cares. Uh, about this larger community, and everybody was willing to contribute to bring this you know, to fruition. So, you know, we, we bring this to a close, um, recognizing that there are so many dedicated employees that Pinellas County has, um, and the teamwork throughout has just been amazing. Our staff put in over 125,000 staff COVID hours during this past year. Uh, to try to um, respond to this pandemic. I could not be more proud of our employees. I could not be more proud of the partnerships that have been formed. Um, and I just wanted to stop before we get into the awards and just say thank you. Thank you to the commission uh, for supporting us, for being on these calls, for providing guidance and feedback. You were the eyes and ears of the community. Um, we took that in, put it into the sausage making, and I think as a result, come out with a better product. Um, and again, for you, to our partners, to all of our county staff, and to our executive policy team, I just wanted to start out by recapping that and say thank you. Uh, Barry, I, I just think um, um, what, you, what you've touched on is um, just, a, just, a, just a brief overview of, of the work that's gone on by um, our employees um, from every department just about had a different job during this. And then our city partners and the jobs that all of their city employees did uh, has just been amazing. I just, I just saw a willing energy from everybody. Uh, we weren't perfect. We kept listening to, to many experts. We, we were adapting on the fly. Uh, but then implementing changes with our partners was just unbelievable. I just can't imagine the sheriff, the doctors that we'll be talking about, the city managers, elected officials. Um, the other piece, though, is the, the, the really great support, albeit challenging support at times, from our residents that really were right alongside of us, working closely mm -hmm. with us, giving us feedback, giving us encouragement, challenging us along the way. Uh, we just can't thank them and the business owners that just struggled to survive their year. A lot of it due to the help of the folks that you just talked about and uh, their own resiliency and their own efforts. It's been quite a year, um, and I just really wanted to take the opportunity to thank you and the leadership of this of the county and the cities and our residents and business owners for getting us through this, um, albeit in a tough way, but we got through it um, and still working to recover at this point in many ways, but uh, great work. Go ahead. Great. Thanks. So um, first, I'd like to call up um, Judge Rondolino and Gay Enskeep, the Court Administrator and Chief Judge, um, and they wanted to present an award to our facilities and uh, real estate staff for all of their work this, during this past year. Thanks, Barry. Good morning. Good afternoon, Judge. Yeah, it's been good. Well, he did an excellent job of going over many of the functions that have occurred at the highest levels, uh, the decision makers here on the commission, uh, he didn't pat himself on the back, but he certainly uh, deserves a great pat on the back for shepherding many of the ideas and plans 
uh, through. And all of these great ideas, all the great plans, uh, take ultimately boots on the ground. Um, unfortunately, w when you're dealing with the court system, you're dealing with a lot of elected officials, a lot of judges, and you're dealing with the Supreme Court. And so it's a special case because uh, I, as a chief judge, and everybody in the state, I guess, has to follow the dictates of the leadership of uh, the judicial branch. And in this case, uh, during our period of COVID, the judicial branch had special directives, special needs, things that uh, our court administrator and I had to implement through, through orders. And we looked to you all for help. Uh, and I remember sending a very long uh, letter to Mr. Burton soliciting uh, certain things. Um, it worked. Uh, you all came through, uh, but the boots on the ground in this case that we're honoring are uh, the folks on your staff from the facilities and real estate, uh, real property uh, division. So they were the ones who had to deal with uh, the 69 judges and the over 300 employees, I think, that we have in multiple facilities and the unique needs uh, that we had in order to continue ser giving service uh, to the public during this uh, difficult time. And it, it's still going on. Their work is not done. They're kind of undoing some of the things. For example, um, we see some of them here today, these little plexiglass uh, <laughs> separators. Well, the court system went overboard with plexiglass. We had masks and plexiglass and uh, sanitizers. And uh, you know, I could go on, but I won't. And this was all really, uh, for the most part, uh, provided. And now some of it is the signs being removed, the plexiglass being removed. Uh, I talked to Mr. Royster earlier, and he wisely advised they're saving those and numbering them. So God forbid we have another event like this. We won't have to go out and, and buy additional uh, plexiglass. But let me be brief, and I'm going to read this, and then I'll give Gay an opportunity. This is a just a small token of the judges and our staff appreciation. It's an appreciation award presented to the Pinellas County Facilities and Real Property Division of Administrative Services for going above and beyond in your service to the courts during the 2021 pandemic. Your work ethic, expertise, and responsiveness allowed the courts to continue to operate safely during the public health emergency. And this is being bestowed upon them the 22nd day of June today. So. I'll just be very quick. Um, Commissioner Eggers, I think you said it best when you said the staff um, exemplified willing energy. That any time, um, Mr. Royster, oops, this side, um, any time I had to ask him for just a little thing like, Keith, we're desperate, we need some hand sanitizer, to Keith, we need you to create a, a makeshift jury box, <laughs> including all this plexiglass, no problem. Um, so I, it's dangerous to name people by names because I don't want to leave anybody out, but I did want to say just briefly, in addition to Joe and Keith, in um, the County Justice Center, we had Steve and Scott. In Clearwater, there's Carlos and Larry, and in St. Pete is Mitch. Those are my go-to people, and to a person they exhibited that willing energy. So thank you all so much. You should be very proud of them. Um, they are a pleasure to work with. Thanks. Thank you, Gay. Thanks, Gay. Appreciate it. Chief Judge Gay, thanks so much for this honor. Really, Keith and I have really appreciated it greatly. And it's very kind acknowledgement of the work that Keith and his staff did throughout the year. So thanks so much. And honestly, it's a partnership because Gay is fantastic to work with day in and day out. And she really does help us pull through things. So. Thanks so much, Gay, Chief Judge. We appreciate it. Photo op. Move that way, guys. Move that way if you can. Yeah. There you go.
Next up, I'd like to ask Micah Maxwell, uh, the president, the past president of the Florida City and County Managers Association, and Matt Spore, uh, FCCMA District 7 representative. Come on up. Thank you, uh, Barry. Uh, as Barry said, I'm Micah Maxwell. I'm the Assistant City Manager for the City of Clearwater and the immediate past president as of three weeks ago uh, of the Florida City County Management Association. And, and with me today is Matt Spohr, who you, I believe you all know, uh, the City Manager of Safety Harbor and the, uh, uh, the District 7 Director and hopefully future president of FCCMA in a couple of years. Um, uh, this award was was given to um, Pinellas County and and specifically Pinellas County administration. Uh, the, the award itself is given an appreciation for the individual for an individual or or group of individuals who have unswervingly supported the profession of of city and county management. And uh, uh, you know clearly the county had a heavy lift during this this pandemic. That everything went through the county it seemed, um, but that didn't didn't stop. Uh, Pinellas County from from uh, providing some very collaborative leadership, uh, from in, ensuring that we stayed focused on on what was the most important thing when it was the most important thing, and, and also uh, in making recommendations that, uh, uh, that that were right for the entire county, not just portions of the county. Um, so, uh, you know, from my perspective and, and as the president, with the president's award, it's the only perspective that matters in this situation. So uh, <laughs> I felt like uh, the leadership provided by, uh, um, by Barry and his team um, certainly uh, made the, the profession shine. Uh, and thank you for, for that. And thank you for, uh, for allowing me to present the award. Thank you. On this side, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Over here. Oh, over there. Over there. Well, he's better at this than I am. Yeah. I like that black screen. Thank you, guys. Get the entire team up. You want to come up? Before you guys leave, they're going to get. They want us to get one more. There. More photos. Yeah. Come on, doctors. We already started. So. Come on. <laughs> Excellent. And last, we they, they prepared a quick video um, that we'll show to just kind of highlight. You can see some of the pictures from this past year. starting to feel like life is getting back to normal in Pinellas County. With declining COVID-19 cases and more residents vaccinated every day, it is important to remember what it took to get here. What I remember is a 3 a.m. call um, in, uh, in the first week of March. Um, and as soon as I got that call, I knew that was our first case in Pinellas County. Obviously, there was a lot of fear, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, when we were really learning more about the virus. What we did know is that it impacted those that were older and those with chronic health conditions. I remember a time when we heard stories from Italy where they had to make life or death decisions 
as to who they would even try to treat. And I think for those of us that may have elder parents, um, my mother lives in an independent living facility and just seeing what was happening even in our local facilities, um, it was very scary to think that those type of decisions may have to be made just because there weren't enough resources and personnel to be able to help everybody. In a matter of days, a team of dedicated partners came together to respond to the growing pandemic. One of our biggest concerns was uh, personal protective equipment or PPE. That was one of the uh, uh, key things that we needed to focus on. Uh, we already started to see a, a big shortage on uh, personal protective equipment like N95 masks, gloves, surgical masks, uh, gowns. We started to see that start to deplete as everyone started to panic on you know, how quickly this was spreading. So we had to get really creative in emergency management to start uh, getting a work group together with our business development with Pinellas County and look towards uh, different, um, different corporations that may be able to provide and build certain personal protective equipment. We worked with our cities, our city managers, our mayors, um, and everybody stayed you know, with one playbook. We stayed together. Um, and that speaks volumes to, you know, kind of that team spirit and uh, kind of a, we know we're stronger together. The county also worked hand in hand with the sheriff and other law enforcement to keep people safe in everyday life. Implementing state and national health protocols proved critical to slowing the spread of the virus, which was a particular threat to our aging communities. We had our fire rescue as an outreach to all of our nursing homes. And when you say, you know, we have 150 plus facilities, um, you know, that's a lot to get your arms around. So we had each fire rescue agency deal uh, in their own um, uh, district and work with them directly, checking in on them each day, um, providing uh, training, uh, helping to uh, make sure that they were using uh, personal protective equipment properly, um, working with emergency management to make sure that they had supplies. There is a gut check moment the first time you walk into a room with a known COVID patient um, and that takes a certain special kind of person to be able to do that, to strap on the mask and to knowingly walk into that room. And I can't tell you how proud I am of all of our folks who just did that over and over and over again over the last year and a half. I think something that's difficult is um, going home each day and going, have I been exposed and am I bringing it back to my family? We did not have uh, a single COVID exposure that resulted in, in someone getting sick uh, from an on the job um, exposure to a patient. And that was very remarkable. I think one of the most important steps we took is we formed an executive policy team that could learn from each other, strategize, and then develop options for us. Dealing with mental health, dealing with businesses, dealing with the economic impacts, um, looking at the feeding situation and what was going to happen as schools shut down and people that relied on even like meals from schools, summer programs, daycares, uh, we just saw it as a cascading effect. We had to get creative very quickly. We knew we had to reach our uh, speakers of other languages. We knew that we had to deliver very important and critical information to all members of our community by uh, coming up with different ways of getting the word out, from billboards and beach signs, all the way to radio and TV ads, social media, and even a COVID-19 resource website. We made sure that we touched everybody that we could in this community with the information they needed. I'll never forget the first day um, the state was on the way with the testing kits, and people were already starting to line up, and, and we were promised they would be here at a certain time, and they weren't. I picked up the phone, called the Community Health Center, Elodie, their CEO, and I said, I need some testing kits. What do you have? I need your help. Um, and right away, without hesitation, she got one of her staff members, sent over testing kits, um, and we were able to start that day. Um, and from that day on, it was over a year that we ran testing sites. From the summer of 2020 all the way up until the spring of 2021, uh, we did 193,000 tests. The individuals on site were a combination of licensed practical nurses, registered nurses, CNAs, Florida National Guard. We had county employees, city workers. Baycare's always felt that it was very important to identify patients that were positive in order to contain the spread to their friends and family and to ultimately to our community. So we thought it was really important to step up and be part of that solution. If we look at all the hours from where we started at Tropicana Field and moved to Ruth Eckerd um, in collaboration with Pinellas County, it's way over 100,000 hours. I won't say that we weren't tired. 
We were absolutely exhausted. Everybody was, you know, they were hot days. They were down there in August. Trying to make them as comfortable as possible was a huge importance to us. So feedings had to be done. Hand washing stations because they need to be clean constantly. We got called by the state early in um, uh, mid-December uh, probably and uh, they identified really getting our uh, nursing homes and adult living facilities vaccinated. Our clinicians were frustrated that we weren't making any headway with this thing. They kept seeing sick people and dealing with the uncertainty of all this other stuff, but the vaccine really offered them the first time to go on the offensive and they jumped on it. You know, they, they wanted to provide something that would be an, an actual end to the pandemic rather than just managing the, the fallout from it. People really helped out without any questions or any other considerations. Uh, to just give you an example, while we're, uh, we're, we were standing up the vaccination site, um, uh, one of the first calls was to the Foundation for Healthy St. Petersburg, and they were willing to, without any further questions, to really offer their uh, Center for Health Equity so we could use it as a vaccination site. We operate at five different sites. Uh, it took a couple of hundred people each day to operate them and we utilized all of our fire rescue paramedics uh, from uh, the 18 fire departments, uh, Sunstar helping us with the logistics, uh, Department of Health nurses. They really came together and, and operated as one. There are any number of uh, firefighters, paramedics, and EMTs at the vaccination clinics, uh, and together uh, in partnership with the county and the health department, uh, we managed to, to help vaccinate a, about a quarter million people. At its peak, you know, we were doing 4,000 shots a day as a Pinellas County EMS system, which is just remarkable um, because of all those little gears turning in, in the right direction. We saw the people come in, get their vaccines, and, and saw the look in their faces, how grateful they were, how happy they were, and that was probably one of our most rewarding moments. The Department of Health and numerous partners hosted clinics and community events to ensure everyone had access to the vaccine. We've done things like go into churches, go into schools, going to community centers, um, going where people are to try and help them understand with awareness. We've taken also those same efforts in testing and vaccinations to those areas. I think that we should all be optimistic that things are moving in the right direction, but not lose sight that there are still people getting sick and that there are still people working really hard under really difficult conditions to try to help them. Although we're certainly moving in a great direction, um, I don't think we're entirely done with this yet, and I really do hope that people continue um, to, to make good informed choices for themselves and their families about uh, whether or not they should be vaccinated. I think seeing things open up, seeing people outside, uh, enjoying themselves, we have seen a lot of things um, come back to more of a normal state, and that does give me hope. I'm most proud of the partnerships, uh, how strong the partnerships came together, because ultimately this has been a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic, something that I hope we won't see again in our lifetimes. Folks were exhausted, but no one ever gave up. And they continued to work hard and they continue to figure out these very complex issues. Just an amazing team we have and an amazing community. I'll brag about this, you know, forever. Um, Pinellas County employees were amazing. Everybody had their best intent and their best foot forward. Um, a lot of hard work and, you know, everybody working together. Thank you to everybody for all of your work and your commitment. Even the smallest thing that you may have done may not have seemed important, but everything that we did to get through this together has made a difference. Very nice, Barry. Um, and again, on behalf of the county commissioners, thank you uh, to, to all of our employees, to the doctors, the all of our partners, and we have, you know, a city manager here today, but, you know, certainly others, the other city managers and their staffs, and, and again, you know, to the, to the families that uh, had issues, you know, health issues in their families or financial crises in their families and the businesses that went through it all, um, it's, been a, it's been a tough year. Um, we've gotten through it, um, and um, we will be in the long run better for it. Uh, and as the doctor said, let's pray to God that we don't deal with this kind of thing again. Um, but uh, in any event, I just, uh, it, was a great, it was a great way to at least look back and to put things in perspective and to thank 
not only the folks that, that came to the aid of our residents, but the residents and the business owners themselves. So thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Thank Commissioners, you. any other comment or from you all? Okay. All right. Well, we're going to move um, to consent. Oh, excuse me. I was going to jump over number four there. Um, sorry about that. Uh, we have citizens to be heard. And just to you know, give everybody a heads up, we have Thank about 20, 20 folks that uh, will want to be heard. Uh, most of the folks are calling on the uh, Shell Key and Grand Canal, but there's a few others um, intermixed as well. So without further ado, um, I'm going to try to call a couple at a time so we can have folks ready. Um, uh, to come up when uh, when I call them. So we're going to start uh, with Gary Haas and then uh, Pat Fling and then David Ballard Geddes Jr. Those will be the first three. And you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. I am Gary Haas, and my wife and I have owned a home on Grain Canal at 936 Pinellas Bayway in Tierra Verde, for the past 18 years. It is this experience that has us concerned with the many changes that have occurred and continue unimpeded. Sprouting of condo towers followed mysteriously by disappearing channels. Safe boating and swimming being restricted due to shallow water. Private boat slips being landlocked. And the disruption of the natural habitat for marine life just to name a few. And now the issues extend to the north end of the canal. Further evidence that inaction is not a solution, but is rather an excuse. <clears throat> but commissioners, I am not here today to continue the rhetoric of history and criticism surrounding this dire situation, nor to further justify the premise for corrective action. I can't believe there is anyone that, would, that doesn't agree with mitigation. That being said, I am here to suggest a theme for moving forward. It's decision time. Decision for the scope, timing, and funding of a plan. Scope. The need is to design and build a system that has longevity with reasonable maintenance. Surgery is needed, not a Band-Aid. Timing, it was yesterday, but since this, that isn't feasible, it's tomorrow. We all know if there's a will, there's a way that this project can be fast-tracked. Otherwise, two or three years from now, we could be vying for the dubious distinction of having the biggest and best sandbox in Florida. Lastly, funding. As you know, there are a multitude of financial sources that can and have been used for similar projects, both locally as well as elsewhere in Florida. Although it is unlikely that any plan will receive complete acceptance, comprehensive explanation of the process and options that were considered would enhance the support. A plan that is perceived as being fair and equitable. And let's keep in mind during the entire process, the actual sand mitigation plan must begin now and not be impeded by administrative procedures. Nature waits for no one. In closing, let's save the canal without further delay. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Okay, Pat Fling, David Ballard Geddes Jr., and then Sheila uh, Nagley. Hello, Welcome. Commissioner Edgar, Edgars and Commissioners. I'm Pat Fling, board member of FAST and a member of the Affordable Housing Strategy Team. There are also 30 of our members on the Zoom today. FAST is pleased that three of the proposals for the Penny for Pinellas taxpayer-funded funds meet the criteria laid out in Resolution 19-6, passed by the County Commissioner for the use of Penny for Pinellas affordable housing. Thank you to the developers and the staff for moving these forward. 
We urge you to approve those three projects. However, Project 6090 on Central, this development does not meet the criteria and FAST urges you to vote no on this project. Use of limited public funds should require meeting the needs of the people most vulnerable to the housing crisis, those earning under 80% of AMI. According to the University of Florida Schimberg Center data, 82,000 families in our county are paying more than half of their income on housing. Nearly all of those families have an income that is less than 80% of the area median income, around $50,000 a year for a family of four. We know those numbers have only increased since the pandemic. Please act ethically and vote yes on the projects meeting the resolution's criteria and vote no on Project 6090 on Central. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Okay, David Ballard Geddes Jr., uh, then Sheila Nagley, and then Greg Pound. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, David Ballard Geddes Jr., I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. The Reclaim Water Variance application states that I, the applicant, literally owe my health and my safety. Based on statute 15303 section five, this variance further declares eminent domain rights to take both my real and my personal property. And also it claims rights to take my religion too. So how does this variance apply itself in actuality to the birthing of a water jurisdiction under the 14th Amendment? The Declaration of Independence clearly states that we warned the legislation of our British brethren not to extend their unwarranted jurisdiction over us, calling into question who is us as the Indians tax-free in the 14th Amendment are also recognized as savages in the Declaration of Independence. Savages known for their undistinguished rule of warfare, here to eat us out of our subsistence, to burn down our towns, to ravage our coasts, as declared that these Indians are working as mercenaries transported here to complete perfidy and works of death. Declared as savages, authoring the Declaration of Independence tax-free in the unwarranted birthing of a 14th Amendment water jurisdiction here to capture the water in Article I, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, recognized as a ship of war in Article I, Section 10 of the Constitution, is the 12 tribes of Israel. The British based on Federalist Paper 39, as enumerated from Article 1, Section 2, are the ones that are to be privileged and immune in the 14th Amendment, and as deduced, as equated, the Christian population is to lose their liberty, property, and life, claimed as due process. The reclaimed water variance application, as based on the 14th Amendment, as based on the Declaration, as based on Federalist Paper 2, reveals a constitutional attempt on the vanquishing of the Christian population in this land using water as its Second Amendment right. And I have a grievance. Thank you. Thank you, David. Sheila Nagley, uh, Greg Pound, and then Sarah Bale, or Bal. Sheila Nagley, I've got a pass. Uh, Sheila's not here? Oh, oh, you're passing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Greg Pound, Sarah Bale, or Bally, and Jack Parker. Greg Pound, Largo, Florida. Um, this is Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Unto the woman he said, I will great, greatly multiply thy sorrow and conception, and in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, but he shall rule over thee. What it's saying is, is the desire of the woman is to be the man. She wants to be the head. And so that's why in the New Testament it shows that big confrontation that goes on between men and women in the family. Now what I want to speak on is this news report on Fox yesterday that they have a problem in Chicago. 45 people were shot on Saturday. 
And the mayor, um, Lightfoot, Lori uh, Lightfoot says it's a public health crisis called racism. So Fox News brings up four of their commentators, and one is a black man, and, Miss, and Lightfoot is a black woman. She's the mayor over Chicago. And this, uh, and it's, his name is Leo Terrell. And so you want to look this up, this news report, and watch what they say, because they say the problem is the family. They're, they're, they've separated the children from their fathers, and now we have all this massive problem. And it all started with a lady by the name of Margaret Sanger, a white woman, and you can go to Wikipedia and read what she wrote on how to destroy the family and turn the men into the women and the women into the men. This is so insane that you can't make this stuff up. You can literally read her plan on how to destroy the family. And the strongest family in America was the black family. At one time, E.V. Hill explains the whole thing, how because of racism, it caused the family unit to be so tight and then they came in and showed how to destroy that family was to separate the children from their fathers, get the women a job, get the government supporting the women, and that's, that will wipe them out. Then you have children without fathers out of control and undisciplined. And this is what we've done in America. It's all been done, and it is racism. You listen to what they say, how they attack this woman, and they got this black commentator on Fox News attacking this black woman when she's speaking the truth, and she's standing there at this news conference surrounded by a bunch of big, fat, white women standing there. Go, just, just go watch it. It just came on the news yesterday, one day ago, and they're saying we got a major problem. So the problem is she's right on. Pinellas County is filled with pedophiles. You just had your illegal sheriff in here, Robert Guattieri. You got your illegal county commissioners. We've got nothing but women now running the whole thing. You know, the women are out of control. They're taking, we got more women graduating from college, more women working. We got more women in, in, in um, government now. We've got more women in, attorneys. Okay, who's, where's the family gonna go from? See, and so this is what we have. We have a system now that's breaking down the family. Their goal is to turn you men into the women and the women and the men, and they're doing a real good job. The big valley men, they're all over the place. Thank you. Okay, Sarah Valley, Jack Parker, and then Tammy Parker. Well, thank you, Commissioner Edger Edwards. You got my name almost right, Sarah Valley. <laughs> Very good. Um, I, I'm a proud 20-year uh, resident of Pinellas County. I've lived uh, in many beautiful places. And I most recently moved to Sunset Point, which is a new condominium development in Tierra Verde, which you've also already heard about. And as you mentioned, we are all concerned about the Grand Canal. Uh, from my condominium, we can see the Grand Canal. We can see that it's filling in. We see the restriction on boating traffic that is occurring there. And we're also very concerned about it. Uh, it's important it stays open, as you've heard, for commercial and for residential usage and for the considerable tax revenues that it generates. Uh, however, we do have a couple of specific concerns that I, I don't think uh, my colleague uh, addressed. Uh, one is that we feel there are a number of different dredging alternatives that have been proposed. We are very concerned that the, any dredging alternative uh, is cognizant of the effect that it might have on our, our units, our development in terms of storms, storm surge and wave actions. Because we're right next door to, to Shell Key, that's a very, it is a vulnerable area. Uh, and the second area that is probably more pertinent to this uh, discussion is that we feel it's unfair to, uh, to ask for funding for those of us that do not derive any direct benefit from the Grand Canal. Uh, we can see the Grand Canal. I can also see Passagrill, but you know, don't ask me to fund that. Uh, we, don't have any, we don't have any boat slips. We don't have a marina. And we are, while we are very supportive of this, and, and in any way we can, we don't think that we should be taxed or funded for, for the dredging that is obviously necessary. We look forward to working with the uh, community with, the, uh, with anybody that has good solutions for this, di this difficult problem. Very much appreciate uh, your listening to me, uh, for your service, and the fact that I've been here for 20 years and I've never come here before shows that I'm usually a very satisfied member <laughs> of the community, so thank you. Thank you, Sarah. 
Okay, Jack Parker, Tammy Parker, and Sebastian Font. Welcome. Good afternoon, Commissioners. How are you today? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Jack Parker. I live 449 Third Avenue North on Tierra Verde. I've lived there for 21 years full time, but I've been on and off the island since 1962 when my grandparents built the house. I'm very glad that Pinellas County and Tierra Verde really agree that the Grand Canal must be taken care of. It must stay open. It's very important. It's really a win-win situation for Tierra Verde and the County of Pinellas. Uh, the Board of County Commissioners on March 18th, 2008, passed ordinance number 08-19 adopting the Tierra Verde Community Overlay to be part of the Pinellas County Comprehensive Plan. The vision states that the surrounding waters support a thriving recreational boating industry that is complementary to the character and scale of the community. Residential boating is mentioned six times in that overlay. The entire island passed that by a vote of about 86%, if I remember correctly. This is important because boating is a huge benefit to the entire island, not, this, not just those on the Grand Canal, not, this, not just those with seawall, not just a few. I have copies of that overlay if anybody needs that. It's also on the county website. It seems like the only issue that needs to be resolved is how to pay for the dredging. I would suggest sharing the cost of that to all those that benefit from boating around Tierra Verde. And that should include Tierra Verde, all of Tierra Verde, not just those on the Grand Canal, all of Tierra Verde, because that is a huge benefit to all of us, whether you're on the water or not on the water. But only about a third of the boating traffic is residential. Two thirds of that traffic is commercial, like fishing charters, poker runs, water taxis, boat rentals, etc. Both Pinellas County and the state of Florida benefit from, from that traffic. Both invest to attract tourism. They should pay their share in maintaining the boat access to Tierra Verde the same as they pay for beach renourishment, Shell Key, Fort DeSoto, and other tourist attractions. These benefits are not just for a few residents that live on the Grand Canal. Please consider these three suggestions. Number one, sharing a third of the cost for the dredging of all of Tierra Verde residents and commercial properties based on property value, not on the amount of seawall. Boating is a benefit to all of us on Tierra Verde. Look at the overlay. Number two, consider sharing a third of the cost from Pinellas County since they benefit from Tierra Verde as an attraction to fishing charters, boat rentals, marinas, hotels, restaurants. Number three, consider a third of the cost to the state of Florida, which also benefits tremendously from Tierra Verde and attraction tourism. Thank, thank you very much for your time. Yep, thank you, Jack. All right, Tammy Parker and then Sebastian Font. And those are the last two I have that are in the room. So if I've missed somebody, um, Make sure you get a card. Did you get a card in over here? Okay. Well, we'll get. We'll, we have the, some people that have signed in online as well. So. Okay. Go ahead, Tammy. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Tammy Parker, 1100 Pinellas Bayway South, L1, Tierra Verde. First, I want to thank Chairman Eggers and all the members of the BOCC for allowing me to speak today and understand the importance of acting now to save the Grand Canal. My husband and I made Tierra Verde our home in 2017. The reason we bought at Sterling on the Gulf was for the deep water boat slips. We paid at closing $2,200. $245 for taxes to the state under the submerged land lease agreement. We soon learned about the sand accumulation issue on the Grand Canal and how it is negatively affecting our marina at Sterling. 
As of today, the first five slips are filling in. We own slip number four. I watched your last meeting on June 8th and Chairman Long is correct. This concern has been expressed by many and going on for many years. My husband and I have attended many meetings at TVCA, two meetings held with the county at Tampa Bay Watch, and last March 2020, I spoke to the BOCC. After that meeting, Commissioner Peters said to the BOCC, the Grand Canal is in every option. Permitting needs to get started for the Grand Canal since in every option. I left that meeting feeling optimistic that permitting and dredging was going to start soon, which doesn't even include removing the sand from our slips. It's been over a year since I spoke, and we are still watching the sand accumulate and the narrowing of the passage. I understand the pandemic hit, which drastically affected our lives. It did mine as a teacher. But as Ms. Long said, Mother Nature is not waiting. The red navigational marker has become part of what is now a beach. It concerns me to hear that Colony Key is taking ownership of this dry sand via quiet titles. We have heard and seen many boats run aground from our condo. Recently, someone removed the red triangles from the marker but left the piling. It is not safe for all the recreational boaters navigating north to the marina where they keep their boats. Next, funding. The canal closing is expressed by many, not just the residents. Did you know the Grand Canal is also known as Dense Channel on many navigational maps? I understand from June 8th meeting that 75 to 90 percent of the canal usage is by commercial and recreational boaters. Chairman Eggers asked to get the verbatim comments, which had a good summary of issues and concerns that were raised that day. Speaker Brad O'Brien, Robert Mueller, Philip Burgess, Sharon Calvert, to name a few. They did a great job explaining how important the Grand Canal is to their businesses and all the recreational and commercial boats that use the Grand Canal. Mr. Burgess gave funding ideas such as tourist tax, gas tax, sales tax, submerged land lease tax. It's not a private canal. It's a very prop popular public canal. Time is of the essence. The Grand Canal needs to be dredged before it closes off. Many feel a lot of the sand, not all the sand, is due to beach restoration projects that go on south of St. Pete Beach up to north of Clearwater. We know the importance of restoring our beaches, but the sand moves and a lot is caught in our passes and channels. If beaches are going to be on a maintenance schedule, then so does maintaining our waterways to remove the migrating sand. A lot of people okay. have a stake in the Grand Canal, which is why we are looking for you for a quick and e equitable solution for all who enjoy the Grand Canal. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Okay, Sebastian Font and then Kathy Filippelli, who did register the right way. I just missed it, so thank you, Kathy. Go ahead. Uh, Board of Commissioners, thank you for listening today. Uh, my name is Sebastian Font. I'm a licensed sea captain uh, and a resident of uh, Tierra Verde, Pinellas Bayway South. Uh, I'm also the owner of Island Ferry. Uh, we operate four charter boats from the Tierra Verde Marina. Uh, I'll be the first to tell you that the bulk of the Grand Canal traffic are visitors and tourists and commercial operations, not residents. Um, we've been discussing this issue for five years, um, five years now, and time has run out. Uh, canals and passes are all about tidal flow. Uh, Dr. Wang has confirmed it from USF. Uh, as well as Aptim, the, the county's own um, consultant. Uh, they've confirmed that as well. And that's why for decades there was never a problem with the Grand Canal, until now. Um, December of 2000, Pinellas County took over responsibility for the care and the management of the preserve. At that time, when you signed that lease with the state, the North Pass of Shelkey by the condos was open and flowing. Um, the Shelkey lease required the county to submit a management plan, and in that plan, Objective 3.3 uh, states that Pinellas County, quote, shall protect and conserve marine habitats, including coastal wetlands and tidal streams. The lease agreement goes on uh, in Section 15, states Pinellas County shall assume full responsibility for all liabilities that accrue to the leased property. Section 26 of the lease agreement states Pinellas County is responsible for any damage or depreciation of value to the lease premises or the adjacent properties or any part thereof. 
And Section 36 states Pinellas County is responsible for maintaining any and all existing canals and the like in as good condition as the same may be on the effective date of this lease. So that North Pass and the opening to the Grand Canal is the county's responsibility, passing the buck on to, to the uh, Tierra Verde Grand Canal residents um, is, is just like that, passing the buck. Upland riparian properties do not have ownership rights nor management responsibilities um, to Shelkey or the opening of that canal. What I will tell you is now is the time to open up that, that North Pass while Irma's Pass is still open. Because with Irma's Pass being open, when you dredge the North Pass, you're, you're going to regain a tidal current that you've lost in 1998, which started this chain reaction. You open that North Pass quickly, and it'll be decades before you'll ever have to look at the Grand Canal problem again. Thank you, Sebastian. Thanks very much. Kathy Filippelli, and then I, I see David, David, Dave Lobb also uh, signed. A, I, he didn't, is he here? Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you for letting me go a bit out of order. This way I can return to, uh, to work. And um, as Pat Fling, my coworker and FAST, had shared, uh, we have 30 people online. This way I can go back to the office and watch the rest of it and how you vote. So thank you. Um, the first go around, you heard from us with affordable housing that we were quite disappointed because that was only 13% that met that. But we were real excited when your staff let us know that this next go around has 57% of their units for affordable housing for folks making $59,000 or less. Want to make it 100%? Then you need to vote no, as Pat said, with Project 6090 on Central. Now, I'm excited because I live in St. Pete and have lived there for 41 years. And Central Avenue is a few blocks down, and that would be awesome. But to have 204 units and only 42 of them meeting the resolution, that's where we ask you to say no and let it come around, let them work on that. Because again, we want you not just to aspire, but to continue to make it happen with the affordable housing. So again, you're missing Donna Davis, our Peppy Donna. She's in Minnesota. You're missing Flo Young. So some of us from the working crew had to take an extended lunch to be with you. But you know FAST is here. We will continue to be here. We appreciated uh, Commissioner Tara Eggers coming out to our Nehemiah action. It's good to see all of you looking healthy and hopefully your family is the same because we were praying for you on that evening. And we know that you will vote well this afternoon. So for those three, but the central one, please vote no because we need it to meet the resolution. Thank you for your time. Thank and you, Kathy. Time. Okay, um, I, I'm not seeing anybody else that's here, and I'm not seeing anybody raise their hand. So we will go to some uh, online folks. Um, we'll go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have 10 individuals who have pre-registered to speak online. The first individual is Ms. Lorraine Dana. Ms. Dana, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone to speak on this item. And then once you're unmuted, if you could state and spell your name for the record, state your address, you will have three minutes, ma'am. My name is Lorraine Danner. I live at 779 Ponce de Leon Drive, Tierra Verde. Uh, I have, um, I'm here to speak on the Tierra Verde Grand Canal issue. My husband and I have lived in a private home on the Grand Canal for over 30 years. Our canal frontage is approximately 150 feet. Uh, we have maintained our property and seawall during those years. And even though we have owned boats in the past, uh, we and two of our immediate neighbors and other residents along the canal are boatless. Directly across the canal from us are condos with three to four occupied boat slips in the same amount of frontage as ours. I propose that the cost of dredging be paid for by boat owners uh, and canal users. Uh, to tax those who just live on the canal is unfair and may be a hardship for many. 
On some days, as we sit on our deck, we see all types of watercraft go by, from kayaks to the 113-foot starlight sapphire dining yacht. The one thing we don't see as often is the family of dolphin that would swim by every evening around 6 o'clock. We all know about the constant commercial use of the canal, and that's fine. I propose that they pay their fair share to correct the problem. So many residents, myself included, feel the designation should be changed from residential to commercial and that the cost of replenishment should be shared by the users of the canal. Uh, we know that timing is critical, so I am requesting that the funds to save the Grand Canal be sought through the commercial users and through county, state, and federal programs. Whatever you can do to help us keep the canal open would be greatly appreciated by the homeowners, the canal users, and maybe even the dolphin. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, our next speaker is Mr. Thomas Eskridge. Mr. Eskridge, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone to speak on this item. And again, Mr. Thomas Eskridge, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your phone. And Mr. Chair, it does not appear that Mr. Eskridge has joined us, so I'm gonna move on to the next speaker. I have a Mr. Rick Campins. Mr. Campins, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your phone to speak on this item. Again, that's Rick Campins. If you could raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your phone to speak on this item. And Mr. Campins, I do see your name on the Zoom application. The raise your hand button is on the bot, it should be on the bottom of your screen. I'm gonna see if I can get Mr. Campins on. And Mr. Campins, if you could unmute your microphone. And it looks like Mr. Campins might be having some technical difficulties today, so I'm gonna move on to the next speaker. I have a Mr. Bill Bowmeister. Mr. Bowmeister, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application. Uh, once you're unmuted, if you could state, spell your name for the record, state your address, you will have three minutes, sir. Hello, my name is Bill Bowmeister, spelled B-O-U-W-M-E-E-S-T-E-R, and I reside at 910 Pinellas Bayway, Tierra Verde. As a 30-year resident of the Grand Canal, I'm thankful for the opportunity to speak before you today. The video link I shared in my speaker application covers in detail what I'm about to highlight in the next three minutes. First, the sand filling Shell Keys North Pass and migrating into Grand Canal submerged land is state-owned property contractually managed by the county since December of 2000. Grand Canal riparian properties have no ownership or managerial responsibility for this land. Yet the state, who is the sole owner, is surprisingly excluded from the county's proposed non adverse assessment role. Four decades of history suggests the proposed project is just a Band-Aid approach and not a permanent fix for the Grand Canal sand migration problem. It is also highly unlikely funds from such an assessment will ever be collected in time to prevent the canal from closing. Ongoing maintenance costs is also of great concern. With Irma Pass still opening, uh, still open, reopening of the original North Pass is the most economical long-term solution of our sand migration problem. I understand the original owners of Colony Key acquired private ownership of half the submerged land in the preserve's North Pass during Tierra Verde's early development. That ownership is now in control of Sunset Point's HOA. Their development manager states a quiet claim to that now dry sand was never made, which suggests the private maintenance permit acquired for the failed 2013 North Pass dredging may still be valid. Further discussions between Sunset Point and the county need to clarify this important issue. His history suggests Emmer's Pass will eventually close if the North Pass is not reopened, making a bad situation even worse and more costly to fix for all parties involved. Aptum and Dr. Wang's studies have confirmed the Grand Canal's pending closure 
and the disruption of the reserve's crucial dual inlet tidal stream can be linked to two important events. First, the state allowed the preserve South Pass to close in 1998. Second, the county allowing the North Pass to close in 2015. Considering the ecological damage Shelkey's beach erosion has had on an important navigational inlet and a highly ranked turtle and shorebird habitat, it's hard to fathom why in 2020, the state's Department of Environmental Protection still ranks Shell Key as a non-critically eroded beach. Florida Statute Chapter 161 will never become a viable funding resource if this status remains in place. It is my hope both the county and state will take ownership for this crisis and take the necessary steps to fund a workable solution before it's too late. I thank you for your time. And Mr. Chair, our next speaker is Mr. Robert Rode. Mr. Rode, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application. Once you're unmuted, if you could state, spell your name for the record, state your address, you will have three minutes, sir. And Mr. Rode, you will have to unmute on your end. Can you hear us? Go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Robert S. Rohde, owner of a condo at Sunset Point. I'm a retired federal employee of 35 years, formerly a physicist with the Department of the Army. My last position was in the Pentagon at, as deputy for laboratory management for all 26 Army laboratories, including those of the Corps of Engineers. In 2010, I initiated federal legislation on behalf of Marco Island residents regarding the Coastal Barrier Resources System and testified in 2014. H.R. 890 was eventually sponsored by Congressman Kurt Claussen of Naples and co-sponsored by Don Beyer of Alexandria. It became Public Law 114-128 in February 2016. I am familiar with a similar dredging effort in 2012 of Marco, Marco's Collier Creek entering into Collier Bay, which has private and commercial properties like those on the Grand Canal. The dredging there was paid for by Tourist Development Council funds. Pinellas has also used TDC funds in the past for similar inlet dredgings, and they should be used here as well. Adding Sunset Point to a non-ad valorum assessment makes as much sense as including Sands Point's properties, since none of us have boat docks on the canal or would directly benefit by the canal dredging. My second point involves the disposition of the removed sand. Florida Statute 161.142, Beach and Shore Preservation, Declaration of Public Policy relating to improve navigation in this paragraph two states. All construction and maintenance dredgings of beach quality sand are placed on the adjacent eroding beaches unless if placed elsewhere, an equivalent quality and quantity of sand from an alternate location is placed on the adjacent eroding beaches. On Marco, the dredged sand was placed at the nearest downstream beach. Finally, I am concerned about dredging alternatives which include basins and end of connections in front of Sunset Point. These structures could promote wave buildup and tropical storms, creating a hazard to many nearby properties. Sand attenuates the wave action and reduces these hazards. On page three of Army Corps of Engineers report, Coastal Risk Reduction and Resilience, July 2013, it states, beaches are natural and nature-based features that provide coastal storm risk reduction. The sloping near shore, shore bottom causes waves to break, dissipating wave energy over the surf zone. There was no discussion in the past engineering presentations about these potential hazards or that these structures have worked at other dredged inlets. I was recently informed that a basin was considered for an inlet dredging near Jupiter, Florida several years ago, but there was controversy about implementing it. Many local residents, up to 100 boats on weekends, currently enjoy the shallow beach area at Sunset Point, anchoring just offshore. A sudden drop of eight feet or more could be a, also be a safety hazard, particularly for small children playing in the adjacent shallow water. The extra cost for creating these basins could be better spent for required maintenance for an entire 15-year permit. Just dredging the canal would be more cost-effective, particularly with the uncertainty of future storms. Thank you for allowing me to comment on this important matter for myself, Sunset Point owners, and our neighbors along the Grand Canal who are facing an unjust assessment. And Mr. Chair, our next speaker is Mr. Kevin Moore. Mr. Moore, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone. Uh, once you're unmuted, if you could state, spell your name for the record, state your address, you will have three minutes, sir. Hello, I am uh, Kevin Moore. I live at 
Third Avenue North and Tierra Verde. And I'd like to have uh, three points relative to uh, the Grand Canal. Um, and I hope to be brief. Um, I'm gonna reiterate, I think, three standard points that have been made. First, um, the selected uh, path forward for the Grand Canal must not be a Band-Aid and it must uh, consider the complexities of the past. Um, and I believe uh, in the past we have considered uh, these complexities, um, but it would be a serious uh, mistake to just select the least expensive option. We need to select an option that takes into consideration the pass as it is today, with Irma Pass being open, the south entrance to the pass, but also, also the north end of, of the Grand Canal. Um, we always have to remember that uh, the Grand Canal has been open without incident for, for 70 to 80 years. Um, what has changed is of significant concern. The second issue that we, uh, we, sh we should always consider is payment. Um, living on the Grand Canal uh, is, is, a, is fantastic and Tierra Verde is a wonderful place, but we also operate a business here on the Grand Canal. And the state of Florida and, the, and Pinellas County are not only contractually obligated to, to maintain that pass, just like the roads in front of the house, um, my road to do business on the back side of the house as we operate our business uh, with the Lady Jane Catamaran is critical. Um, and making that navigable is, is the utmost concern. And remember that um, you know, we pay quarterly taxes to the state on, on revenue, and then we also pay a 1% sales surcharge that is discretionary relative to the county. Um, any assessment to ownership uh, because I live on the Grand Canal, is probably of great concern, and, and it really feels like double-dipping. My final point is something that all of us agree on, I believe, is that we're already really late in, in getting this solved. Um, this problem isn't going to fix itself. It is up to your, you guys to actually put an, an, an action and a plan forward, vote on it, and then move it forward. Uh, action today is of critical concern. It is not gonna get better. Talking about it is getting um, a little bit out of hand and we need to act. Uh, and, and it is the county and the state's responsibility to figure out the path forward. Yesterday was too late. Tomorrow is, uh, is our next opportunity. Let's Thank do it. You. Thank you, Robert. Mr. Chair, the next speaker is Walt Silvera. Mr. Silvera, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone to speak on this item. And once you're unmuted, if you could state, spell your name for the record, state your address, you will have three minutes. Uh, hi, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Walt Silvera, S-I-L-V-E-I-R-A. And I live uh, in uh, Sunset Point, 800 Colony Road. I'm a resident and a neighbor of Sarah, as you, you all met. Uh, as you know, our development is near the Grand Canal dredging project. And uh, as a boater and a neighbor, uh, you know, I support our neighbors that need to keep the Grand Canal open for their commercial and private use. Uh, as laid out by Sarah and some of the other folks, I do have two concerns uh, that I'll bring up and be short. You know, the first one is any proposal that causes any increase of risk to our property and specifically the storm surge issue that has been brought up and, and clearly identified. Uh, our property is surrounded by beach and shallow water that protects us against storm surges and wave action from the west and the mouth of uh, Paso Grill Channel. Um, and any proposal that would deepen that area could compromise protection and increase the, the risk. So uh, I'm willing to work with the county to explore any options that you know, may better serve uh, for all of us. The second uh, concern is the proposed funding, uh, unfairly targeting owners that do not use uh, the Grand Canal. And I, I think there's been some good uh, identification of that through some of the other speakers. Our property owners, uh, you know, we do not have any slips or use the Grand Canal 
uh, should be excluded from any formula to fund this project. Uh, we do not have any boat slips, marina, or other facilities that depend on whether or not the Grand Canal is open. And we do not drive any benefits, special otherwise, from the Grand Canal. In fact, if the Grand Canal were to actually close, uh, some folks have talked about, you know, that the that sand surge is actually increasing and making the beach bigger as it encroached over the, the actual channel marker, as was identified. So, again, uh, you know, I want to thank the board for their consideration. I think keeping the Grand Canal open benefits many of our neighbors and businesses, plus their employees. It also generates significant tax revenue to the city of St. Pete and the Pinellas County and the state of Florida. Um, so thank you for your time and listening. And, and I know that, you know, myself and many of us are willing to try to work to a, a good solution to the issue at hand. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, our next speaker is Dr. Craig Valentine. Uh, Dr. Valentine, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone to speak on this item. And again, Dr. Valentine, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on the telephone if you've joined us today. And Mr. Chair, it does not appear that Dr. Valentine has joined us, so I'm gonna move on to the next speaker. The next speaker I have on my list is Mr. Mark Strode. Mr. Strode, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone to speak on this item. Once you're unmuted, if you could state and spell your name for the record, state your address, you will have three minutes, sir. Hi, I'm Mark Stroud, S-T-R-O-U-D, and uh, my business is at 1120 Pinellas Bayway, Tierra Verde, Florida. Um, I currently serve as the development manager for Colony Key Development, LLC, and we were the developers, or we are the developers of Sunset Point. I've been asked by a few of the residents uh, and the HOA presidents to make a few remarks today, hopefully to clarify our position, but I'll say Walt and Bob and Sarah have done a great job of doing that already, so I'll be very brief. Um, first, I want to thank the county staff for their willingness to meet with uh, the HOA committee leaders and myself on this subject early on the process. We definitely look to keeping a, an open dialogue with Kelly and her staff on this issue. Um, I know that there have been many opinions and facts and some alternative facts, in fact, that have come up on this issue regarding what caused the migration of the sand and how we, we might move forward. And I think as first point, uh, position goes, you know, we have a couple of points we'd like to make. Uh, Sunset Point has not completed any work seaward of the upland retaining wall that surrounds our property. Uh, records will, sh will show that those areas have been unchanged for many, many years uh, before we started the project. Uh, we have worked extremely close with the county staff on the project from the very beginning and have been very careful to follow the county's guidelines to the T. Uh, the second point is uh, was already made uh, by Bill, I believe, that Sunset Point, uh, Colony Key Development, or nobody on the island for that matter has ever attempted to file suit to quiet title on accreted land. We have, in fact, always owned in fee the land to the center of the former North Channel. Uh, nothing has changed except that that North Channel is now Sand Beach. Um, so those are the primary points I wanted to make. I do think that we need to point out that, uh, as it's been said before, um, the residents of Sunset Point will not receive any special benefit from the dredging of Grand Canal and therefore need to be removed from any calculation of the non ad valorem uh, calculation. Uh, just to remind everyone, according to the court, there are two requirements which must be met to assure the validity of a special assessment. The property assessed must derive a special benefit from the service provided, which we don't, and the assessment must be fairly and reasonably apportioned among the properties that receive the special benefit. So even if it was argued that we did receive in some form or fashion a spe special benefit, uh, it's clearly not fairly apportioned. For example, uh, the, the, the marina with almost 500 slips and businesses, hotel and restaurant has about the same frontage as we do. We have no slips. Thank and you. Actually have hey, Mark. Things. Hey, Mark. Uh, thank you. Hit your three minutes. Appreciate it. Thank you. 
Mr. Chair, our next speaker is coming in from the phone line, Mr. Dennis Marquis. Mr. Marquis, if you could press star nine on your telephone to speak on this item. And then it'll ask you to unmute, so you'll press star six to unmute. Once you're unmuted, if you could state and spell your name for the record, state your address, you will have three minutes. Uh, good afternoon, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Okay, my name is Dennis Marquis. M-A-R-Q-U-I-S. My wife and I live at 534 Canales Bayway South, Ontario Verde. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm a year-round resident of Terra Verde, living in the Pinnacle condominiums on the Grand Canal. I'm here to offer our point of view on the proposed dense channel brick dredging project. As a retired couple who are located here from Pennsylvania, I believe we willingly support the economic prosperity of Pinellas County. Since purchasing our home in Terra Verde two and a half years ago, in addition to paying our county taxes and the Terra Verde Community Association fees, we've also purchased a new boat, a new car, renovated our kitchen, added a new AC system, and bought new furniture for our home, all from Pinellas County owned and operated business entities. We enjoy an active social life in Pinellas County. As a result, we frequent local restaurants, music venues, golf courses, and museums. We pay the annual Fort DeSoto parking pass to take advantage of parks, beautiful beaches for swimming and recreational fishing. I'm sure the commissioners would agree that the county anticipates continued economic benefit from the Tierra Verde retirement community. My wife and I are happy to do so and view it as a quid pro quo. We spend our hard earned retirement funds throughout Pinellas County and you the commissioners help provide a thriving community for all of us to enjoy. Now, all of you are considering a new tax on retirees like us in order to have us finance the dense channel dredging project, a project that is needed to keep an important public waterway open for continued use by recreational boaters and commercial enterprises. I understand that I benefit from living on the waterway. However, it should be equally clear that the shared waterway benefits all of Pinellas County. It is one of the aspects of county life that brought us here, along with our retirement savings uh, to, and helps to keep us here, supporting the county financially in all the ways I previously described. I also want to point out, just as many others have, that Dench Channel is literally used by scores of non-resident boaters, both recreational and commercial, every day. In fact, the weekend boating traffic has become so dense that we choose to stay at home as we feel it's unsafe on the water. There's a continued stream of boaters back and forth from Shell Key down the canal to Port 32 Marine Resort, the Island Grill Restaurant, and the Marriott Residence Inn. This is no exaggeration, and I welcome any of you to come sit on my balcony with us and watch it for yourself. I also understand that if you, the county commissioners, choose to assess this new tax, the county can then has the right to impose this tax in the future as needed. We bought our home in Terra Verde on the Grand Canal, understanding that the canal is a shared water resource. One that is important to the economic viability of the entire county. We urge all of you to vote against such a prejudicial tax on county canal residents such as us, and we urge you to keep the canal open. Thank, Thank you. you for listening, and may God bless you and your work. Thank you, Dennis. And Mr. Chair, I do not have any other speakers for this agenda item. Nobody else. I, no. I have one other name here, and, um, and none of the other folks that tried, I guess, huh? Yeah. Okay. We, thank you. Thank you, Kat. I appreciate that effort. Um, and I think, uh, again, seeing nobody else in the room, we'll move on to our consent agenda. I um, make sure I have this right. I had, I as I've been doing, I try to at least mention items that are that are going to take county funds on the consent just for the record. So under item 11, uh, award to Smith Industries, uh, it's a fence company, uh, award of um, $2,252,000 for a five-year uh, for a five-year term for um, uh, for those kinds of services will be needed over that five-year period. So it's, that's $2.25 million. Another item under consent is an award to Camara Water Solutions for sulfate. It's something for our solid waste industrial water treatment facility. Uh, be uh, 335,325 a year, five-year total of 1.67 million. 
A third item is award to Core and Main LP for water meter boxes, lid materials, and accessories, totaling $5,147,000 over five years. And the final item is an award to Neptune Technology for water meters, reclaim meters, and water meters for utility department for a five-year contract not to exceed $2.5 million. So we had those four items among others on the consent agenda. Unless somebody wants to pull anything, I need a motion for approval. Move approval by Commissioner Flowers, second by Commissioner Gerard or Gerard, okay. Um, all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries six to zero. All right, we will move on to our regular agenda. Okay. Mr. Burton, under Development Review Services, please. Item number 17 is reappointment of special magistrates for our code enforcement. Uh, this is appointing three existing special magistrate to a new three-year term. Any questions? Need a motion? Move approval from Commissioner Seal. Second from Commissioner Gerard. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Or six to zero, excuse me. Number 18. This is an affordable housing construction loan to Delmar Terrace um, uh, South LLC for multifamily rental housing development. Um, this will provide um, $500,000 utilizing state incentives partnership funds. The uh, uh, loan terms is specified, and again, it's for affordable units, um, all of them 60% or less. Okay. Any questions by the commission? Need a motion, please? Commissioner Long on the motion, Commissioner Flowers on the second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries six to zero. Item 19. I'm very pleased to present a recommendation for four awards to our Penny for Pinellas Affordable Housing uh, Program funds. Uh, these recommendations include a, um, a project for Whispering Pines Apartments. This is $680,000 for 20 uh, multifamily affordable housing units uh, at 60% less area median income. The project you heard about before, 69 Ellen Central Avenue. This would be for 204 units, of which 42 units would be with incomes below 80%, 141 units at incomes below 120%, and then 21 at market rate units. Um, item, um, project number three is with Volunteers of America for $1 million. This is 51 units um, of affordable units at 60%, area median income. And then the final one is Oak uh, Hearst Terrace by uh, Southport. Uh, this is for $6.75 million for 220 units, um, again, serving 60% area median income. With these units, we now have provided $23.4 million uh, towards our affordable housing projects, producing 884 affordable units, of which 524 of those are at 80% less area median income. Okay, okay that was, uh, yeah, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Maybe we could just, so the public can understand the formula a little bit better about what we're subsidizing, what we're not subsidizing, that the entire project won't be under 60% or under 80%, but the, there's 42 units at that 61 to 80. Um, there's another 140 that are up to 120, and then there's 20 that are market rate. Correct. What are we subsidizing? Are we subsidizing the entire complex for a certain amount? Are we only subsidizing the 42 units? Maybe walk through through that a little bit so we can all. So we have a it. so we have a criteria we look at, and so what you're when you're getting when you're getting into upper incomes, you're providing less of a subsidy per unit. When you get into lower units, if we're providing um, affordable units at let's just say 50 percent area median income, the price per unit is going to be more it, 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 to buy down that cost to where they're affordable. Um, when you get a mixed unit development, you're kind of getting all that above because you're getting the economy of scale of a large complex which drives the per unit cost down and then you're getting a mix of different types of housing units uh, so we evaluate all that in determining whether or not we believe it's a a project eligible for funding when they bring that recommendation to you and so i mean that's not listed on our on the sheet maybe for the next round we could get the per unit did i miss that 
Probably in the detail, I'd have to look that up. Seven, oh, 17,000. 17,000 per unit. That's for the entire, for every, that's just an average. That's, a, that's an average. Right. Yeah. Here, I'd, I'll have to pull it up. I don't know. Tom, or here, Bruce is coming up. Bruce can help answer some of your questions. Good afternoon, Bruce Bussey, Community Development Manager. Um, in your packet of materials, we did include a summary project sheet for each project where we outline some of those metrics. So in terms of that cost per unit, we look at that several ways. We divide that total alloc commitment of funding across the entire project. At that amount, it's $17,000 per unit. If we look at just those income restricted units, that number goes up to $19,000 per unit for this recommended project. Um, again, the assisted units in this case would include the workforce housing units, those up to 120. Um, this is a large scale project. It scored higher, it was the highest scoring project in the overall round three applications. A lot of those reasons include the guidelines and the scoring criteria. It, <clears throat> so it kind of checked every box in terms of large scale, mixed use, mixed income, all the metrics that we analyze for cost per unit, developer subsidy and those, that type of analysis and readiness to proceed. What, what would be the most we would subsidize for the affordable units? Or is there, do we have a, a kind of a guardrail or a cap that we have internally? Or? Mm -hmm. We haven't set a specific maximum amount per unit. Uh, most of these metrics, we look at a range. And so we kind of compare that to averages, you know, a per, per average unit cost today is gonna be much different than it was <laughs> frankly, just a year ago with, with lumber prices, material prices increasing. So when we look at our projects, we look at averages in those categories based on other project examples and make sure that they're within range on construction cost, um, any land acquisitions, we get an updated appraisal to measure that cost and, and evaluate the overall project. I was just doing the math on the 3.5 million requested. If we just divided that among the 42 units, that's in that cap, it's $83,000. If we just, if we just did formula that way, and I, I guess I'm, I know it's semantics maybe, but it also is to the, some of our speakers points of we're subsidizing units that are not in that range that we've all been talking about. So that's where I'm trying to wrap my head around the, the uh, subsidy amount. I suggest that one of the challenges there is to increase that lower income set aside would require higher subsidies than $3.5 million. So in other words, to get more of those units that are currently planned to be restricted to 120 down to that 80% level would require an increase on the 3.5 million. So it's one of those balance concerns. Um, and from the scoring criteria and the guidelines, it does reward points for a mixed income project. Commissioner Gerard. Yeah, I just, um, Kind of frustrating that um, as much as we talk about wanting to do these mixed income projects and fast people will say they understand that and you know they support that every time we have a project that's not a hundred percent under eighty percent AMI they come out and start criticizing us I guess and this project that's just frustrating to me we're trying to do good things here. We're looking at 42% of the units, which is 20% of the total units, and we're paying 7% of the cost of the total project. So again, I think we're getting a deal here, even though it looks like when you spread out that, what we're, okay, so out of 300, we have 332 under 80% AMI, and another 141 that are up to 120% AMI, which isn't a whole lot of money to begin with. Um, you know, I would love to fund projects under 60% AMI at 100% all day long, but that's not realistic and it's not the kind of projects that we're gonna get 100%. I mean, never mind. I just think we're, so, 
you know, the more we do these mixed use or mixed income projects, the more developers we have on hand or that have worked with us before that are going to be willing to do something again. And, you know, the handful that are, that are able or willing to do 100% uh, project with uh, under 60% AMI is very, very limited. And I don't think we can expect every dollar to go into that kind of project. And that's the last time I'm going to make that argument. Um, yeah, just one second. I just want to ask, I'm looking at uh, your presentation that we haven't had yet because we haven't asked for it. But in there, there was a, there was a, a, a table that talked about the um, cost per unit. Um, Oakhurst Trace and Whispering Pines both are 60% and under AMI projects. That's what, at least that's what it says, income levels served. Both of them under 60%. One 220 units and one 20 units. Both of those costs were thirty to $34,000 per unit. So, so again, those were both projects under 60%, both at over $30,000 per unit. Am I reading that correctly? Or in not? terms of county funds per unit, correct. That's what I'm asking. Okay. So when you go to the other, the market rate one, the zero to market, and, the, and I guess income level 22 to 60 percent. Anyway, they're considerably lower per unit, um, and they are multiple size. So what, th there's obviously a, a number of things that you're looking at in determining a viable project for use of these funds. But per, per unit isn't the driver. I mean, because you're, you're picking projects that have per unit costs for us that we're using that are higher. So I think we're just trying to understand yeah. the criteria that you all are using in selecting these projects and making sure we're clear. So um, and maybe I, we need to take a look at this presentation. I, I'm, well, I, I think the, I don't think there is a, Okay, we'll fund it if it's between you know twenty and you know twenty thousand dollars a unit for this type of um, projects and thirty thousand dollars if it's eighty percent or below. We don't have a fixed criteria like that. We look at each development in total. We've had conversations internally with staff about the the percentage of the developer fee. It's one of the questions you guys have asked us, and so we said, okay, what's a reasonable amount? Each one of them is a little different depending upon their volume or their, uh, the project. Some of them have state or federal funds which drive what that percentage will be. Some of them have uh, a multiple of, of, of different funding sources. Some are providing supportive housing. And so it's a different type of unit. So, so it is kind of complex and we're looking at, that's the reason we're using the point factoring system to try to give us a overall balance about ones we're willing to recommend. You'll notice that there are six on that were submitted that are not on here for recommendation at this time. Staff's continuing to work with them, work to see if we can bring those to where it's uh, something that we can support. So I, I, don't yeah. think, I don't think I have a, a fixed answer for you. It's something we talk about at staff as they bring these forward. Yeah. And time. without that fixed answer for us, for our clarity and for the residents, that's why we continue having questions because it's not, it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of not, really simple and just for the one that's on central avenue and i think that was the one was that the one that they were we had several calls about yes Correct. the again 17 that it's one of the lowest county funds per unit mm -hmm. and the development fee as a percentage of the total cost is about two percent which is significantly lower than the others so you're getting more value for your project cost and the cost per unit that we're subsidizing is lower. Plus, it's a mixed unit development, which is one of the things that we've said we wanted to target. So that, again, I, I kind of get that. I just, I just wanted to bring a couple of those questions, Commissioner Flowers and then Commissioner Seal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If you look at the projects that are being funded almost 100%, they're all for land acquisition. The project that is the most which is the one on Central, is for construction costs, which construction costs are significantly higher because of raw materials and because of labor right now. Um, so those are, even though they're all for low income, those are two very different 
magnets when you're purchasing land. And sometimes you can get someone to sell you that land for a much lower price because you're building affordable. So it makes your costs lower. So you can afford to do a greater number of units if you're basing it off of that. So if you look at that, that's what they have. I would also concur with you, uh, Commissioner Eggers, um, because Innovair, they are deferring their development fee to the end on the backside of things. When the others are asking for a nominal development fee, but that development fee is up front. The other distinguished piece that I would make is when you look at how much of leverage we get per dollar or for the project. So for DDA development, which is the Central Avenue, we leverage about $14.02 um, per. For the others, they're a little bit higher, $16.93 for the Innovair project and for um, the SP Pinellas 3, you get an even better bargain of $7.53 that's leveraged um, for what we're spending. Um, if you also look, they have some projects within our CRA, which gets them some additional bonus and some that are not. So it is very difficult to, to try to say all of these projects, you kind of line them up and, and they all have to fit into this box. They're not going to fit that way because the developers are utilizing different tools in order to be able to even construct affordable housing. Um, I, I compare, even though these are not home ownerships, but I start looking at how much is it costing the CDC of Tampa when they're building affordable, how much is it costing Habitat when they're building affordable, and how much is it costing these developers to build affordable, and they're right in line. The hard part is, and, and I get what, I, I understand the, agree, the, the binding commitment that was made for utilization of the penny dollars to, to try to put a severe dent into um, units that are 80% AMI and below. That's the greatest need. I know some of the projects that were not targeted for us to approve that are being worked on, they address those needs. But they're having difficulty making their numbers work because of construction costs and because of uh, land purchase availability. And they're not able to, it's upside down. So um, I, I don't think you guys felt like you were going to completely alleviate the housing crisis. Um, I don't think um, that it, it was only going to be 80% and that's all we're going to ever, you know, 80%, 100% projects. I don't think that's what you all thought or else we wouldn't be able to approve projects with mixed use if that was all you wanted to target. So um, I'm, I, I think you all have done a, a decent job in trying to bring us opportunities um, to put a dent in the number of units that we're making available, especially um, making sure that it's what we call dispersed poverty, so it's not building projects, 400 units at one time, but it's placing people with limited income within a multifamily jurisdictional so that they have the same benefits, the same ambiance and everything that a person who may be paying, um, you know, $1,500 a month for rent and they're paying less but they get the same amenities, so I think it's a pretty good job. But I believe one of the higher differences is the difference between the land costs and the construction costs. Oh, oh did, did you, uh, Commissioner Seal, did you, uh, uh, okay. My only concern is, um, and I would agree with my colleagues on the commission, um, you know, and I've brought it up several times before is our goal since I've been on this county commission is not to just produce public housing and put it all in one place. We need to have a balance. And the only concern though I have is there was 210 points available and all of these that are chosen 
um, even go to half the number of points. So I'm a little, and they don't, we didn't get scoring sheets, so I don't know why, for instance, um, the Whispering Pines only got 98 points out of 210, but then you still think that this should move forward with approval? Yeah, a couple of things there. Um, that 210 total points available is probably not attainable. And so in other words, there's no perfect project because to score well in one category, you probably wouldn't score well in another. So 210 is the maximum number of available points. So when we look at the scoring, we go through that process to establish the score. Mm -hmm. We bring the projects forward to you with that score. And the ones that we're recommending for approval today are those that also pass the readiness test. Okay. And so you'll see, you know, six other projects here that, you know, we're not necessarily saying no to these projects, but they haven't provided enough information to commit other funding sources or if there's an entitlement issue or some of those concerns, then, you know, we're going to continue working with them. In fact, of these 10 round three projects, six of those have applied in either round one or round two. So I think what that kind of demonstrates is, you know, the readiness test. These, you know, some of these have applied in the past, but they haven't firmed up a primary funding source. They haven't worked through the entitlements. So we're continuing to work with them until the point where they're ready to proceed. And that's when we're bringing those to you with a recommendation um, for the conditional commitment. So, um, you know, those raw numbers, that 130, that 135, those are pretty high scores in this round and previous rounds. Okay. But yeah, when you look at it compared to 210, thinking you could get 210, <laughs> it's not. I think our top score to date is 160. 160. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. Sure. Commissioner Gerard. Okay, a couple of random questions. So the, the 69 on Central, 6090 on Central, it says we're, we're going to use the penny for money for construction costs. So how, how do we do that? I mean, I thought we could only use the penny funds for land acquisition unless it was part of a larger, is it because there's workforce housing in there? Yeah, when, when there is that nexus with the workforce housing, and I know I saw it mentioned in some of the write-ups on some of these projects, that does um, open us up to use money for the capital projects. So most of you are right. going to see it be like infrastructure supporting the main project. Okay, so is that what it is, infrastructure? Correct. It would go for infrastructure or constru hard costs for the construction. We provide those funds as a essentially a grant, but it's secured with loan documents so that that can enforce the affordability requirements for the 20 year period. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the other question is unrelated to anything here. Have we, I saw that we previously got a request from Pinellas County Housing Authority for Rainbow Village. Have we, are, are you still working on that one? We are still working on that still one. They're still waiting um, for funding. Yeah, they're going to apply this fall for tax credit financing. And so that's actually Grand Oaks has listed on the round three application oh, okay. now. So they've got a, a four phase redevelopment plan, uh, all with the name Oaks in each phase. And um, so they are trying to secure tax credit financing. And as I spoke to Readiness earlier, should they secure that, then I think we'd move forward with a, a recommendation on that one. Great. Right. Okay. Grand Oaks. Um, Back to the scoring uh, that you had on here as well. I'm just trying to, again, get inside um, uh, this. It may be scary, but I want to get inside your all's minds a little bit here, just so that we understand better kind of how you're pulling these together. When you get scoring, and again, I know you're not going to get 210, right? So, but if you get like one of these was in the 130s or 120s or one's 98. Uh, have you gone through that, and I, maybe I've forgotten, uh, gone through that with us and how, you're, how, how you assess points and scoring, and is that what you're using to cut off available uh, projects that you're recommending versus ones you're not recommending in the round of applicants that you have at that time? Are you um, the scoring criteria was developed following the board's approval of the guidelines. So right. the board adopted those guidelines and staff developed a scoring system that would prioritize and award points based on those guidelines. Criteria like the size of the development, income set-asides, mixed income, okay. location in those categories. Um, we have done a presentation on at the workshop in some of those categories. What we haven't done, though, is set a, a minimum score. 
we basically said, you know, let's evaluate the projects based on the guidelines. Once a project is scored, passes the readiness to proceed test, we would bring that to the, to the board for consideration. So we've kind of talked about the idea of setting a, a lower threshold, but there's always that one off or that what if. It could be a small project serving a special needs community and okay. a CRA area that didn't necessarily score very well, but might, might be considered for funding. And the other thing along those lines, some, you know, when we look at projects, if there's a better funding source, the SHIP program or home funds, for example, we might recommend using those dollars rather than penny for. Okay. Okay, maybe, maybe you could send us that refresher on the criteria you're using to come up with the scoring. Certainly. That would be great. Thank you. Commissioner Gerard. Maybe we could, could we get that score, that spreadsheet about how that plays out when you're looking at the projects? I mean, at, when we get a group, could you bring us the scoring Certainly. Yeah, I can summary provide that. as well? Yeah, it has each category and the points per category. And yeah, just so we can see how that works. And as far as for the developers and the applicants, that is posted on the website where the application is. So there's oh, okay. a narrative describing the scoring. And so okay. that prior to applying, they can kind of go through and analyze their project to see how well they're meeting the criteria. But then they also get the scoring itself. Correct. After, okay. We don't, so we'd like to get it. <laughs> Commissioner Long. Well, it seems to me, and I could be wrong, but a few years ago, we used to get that information when we were getting, you know, paper documents somewhere along the line. Uh, we stopped getting that information, and I don't know if it's because staff felt we were dabbling too much in the weeds with regards to the scoring, I don't know. <laughs> but I do know, I do remember seeing those individual scoring, scoring that you all did. I don't, I don't think I made that up, did I? Karen knows. Well, I think you're everything. thinking more of the scoring that we would see when an RFP went out. Oh, maybe. And we would get the copy of those scores. Um, this new affordable housing is more of a new process. But, oh, but okay. I don't think we've seen those scores and and. But you can provide that. I think we should see those. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. stand corrected. Yeah. You're yeah. right. But it was Thank on you. all different things that we had out to bid. It, yeah. Yeah. And I just think it helps us understand a little bit better <laughs> how you're arriving at yeah. the projects that you're recommending, and so that we're just all c collectively a little clearer, and then our residents might. Some of the ones that are questioning things might might be cleared up, and maybe not. But because you're certainly recommending that one project that they're wanting us to not approve uh, for a lot of reasons that are listed right here. So we may not get to all of those and or those questions, but at least some of them, I think would, it would be helpful. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, yes. Sorry, Mr. Justice. Sorry. But I think what is what's the current AMI? The current AMI for a household of four is $72,700. Of what? So also the, that's the total for four and then. So that's a four person eight, household so at the median income be, So for a four person household at 80% AMI, that number is $59,040 a year. 120% AMI for a family of four would be 88,560. Yeah, and it, as we're talking about not wanting to build these, you know, 500 unit complexes. Um, and I think what we haven't really talked about is trying to diversify the geography a little bit on the projects so they are spread out to where folks have access to transportation, access to their jobs, those kind of things. And the reality that we'll have to spend more money for some of those land costs in certain areas, just as if you're going and buying a single unit for, for buying a larger unit. And, uh, and we're seeing that in some of the projects we're looking at today. And, and it, is, it is a hard number. And I, again, I think part of it also is just how we talk about it. Again, when we spread it across all the units, including the units that are not necessarily affordable, not necessarily market, but at the 120, um, I think the public can see that as we're subsidizing these units that are not you know, needed to be subsidized as opposed to just looking at what we are subsidized, that they are the ones that are in the categories and just swallowing the fact that that's gonna be at a higher number than the other one. 
and it's still the same dollar amount, but how we talk about it is a little different. I don't know if that makes any sense to anybody else, but okay. thank you. <laughs> any any other questions? Okay. So do um, and no, no other questions? Do I have a motion? Okay. The motion by Commissioner Flowers, second by Peters. Peters. Thank you. All in favor say Ms. aye. Mr. Chair, uh, I do have one individual who pre-registered to speak online on this item. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. I didn't see that, so I apologize. Go ahead. It's okay. Um, I have a Mr. Jack Humberg. Mr. Humberg, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine to speak on this item. And once you're unmuted, if you could state, spell your name for the record, you have three minutes, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Jack Humberg. It's H-U-M-B-U-R-G. I live at 839 13th Avenue North in St. Petersburg. I'm representing the Whispering Pines uh, application. Uh, I wanted the commissioners to understand that we, we uh, that Pinellas Affordable Living is a corporation uh, that is controlled by Boley Centers. This is a supportive housing development. And uh, thank you for your recommendation to staff. Um, and I just registered in order to uh, answer any questions you might have about Whispering Pines. Okay. I will say that the uh, prior to the start of this process, we did submit comments about the scoring process. Uh, so a project like ours does not score well because we're small. We don't want to uh, have a large congregation of uh, extremely low income uh, individuals in one place. So this is a 20 unit development serving people at or below 50% of the area median income. And we have received financing from the Florida Housing Finance Corporation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Commissioner Gerard. Um, just a question, do we have a scoring category for um, special needs housing? I mean, he makes a good point. No, that's not a scoring cate category currently. Well, maybe it should be. <laughs> maybe they should get points for special needs that would counteract that smaller uh, project. Because, yeah, I, you really don't want 30 or 40 or 100. And often those types of projects are supported by the county with other dollars, home dollars, right. ownership dollars. Right. So, but we well, can certainly. Well, it takes a lot of support for those projects. So, but we do want to be able to provide them. So, I wouldn't want them to lose out on a project because they didn't get any points for dealing with a very difficult population. Anyway. No. Any other questions? All right. Um, sorry about that. Do we did we get we got everybody, Cat? Okay. Again, I was looking at my my notes here, and I had um, that gentleman for item four, and it was really for item 19. So my mistake. So thank you for catching that. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, we got a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion, <coughs> motion carries unanimously. Okay, I think we are moving on to item 20, which is under 20 and 21, both under human services. Mr. Burton. Item number 20 is an agreement with the Sixth Judicial Circuit for our drug court expansion program. Um, this is paid for out of the Alcohol and Drug Abuse and Trust Fund uh, for nonprofit agents. I'm sorry, <laughs> that's going to the next one. Uh, I'm combining two. Um, this is, uh, again, that agreement, and this uh, uh, we contract for treatment with uh, treatment service providers uh, for this program. Any questions for Commissioner Long on the motion, Commissioner Flowers on the second? Oh. So this is federal grant money? Lourdes, it doesn't say on here. I think it, uh, well, it was started with a grant. Yes or no? Is it, is it now? So it started with federal money and now it's state. Oh, now it's state money? Get to a microphone, please, somewhere. 
Yeah, it's okay. better old now state. Sorry, Lourdes Benedict, Assistant County Administrator. Um, so it started off being federal money and now it's state. Okay, well, good for them. <laughs> it's a great program. Okay, any questions? We got a motion and a sec second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 21. This is a funding recommendation for the Alcohol and Drug um, Abuse Trust Fund program uh, with nonprofit agencies. Uh, this is a competitive process um, that they do each year and they provide grants from $2,000 to $10,000. Motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Gerard. Any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, moving on to authority boards, constitutional officers, and councils. Career source Pinellas, I think we have three or four well, items. But Jennifer's ahead. here with us, but uh, the first one is appointments to the, uh, to the career source board. Uh, this approval uh, for one business seat that expires June 30th, and for one education and training seat also. I have a motion. I'm sorry. Did, who, who, did you make the motion? I'm sorry, Commissioner Flower. Commissioner Long on the second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous or carries six to zero. Go ahead. The next is item 23. This is approval of 12 reappointments to the board. Second. Motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Long. Any questions? All in favor say aye. Any opposed? Motion carries six to zero. Item 24. This is a first renewal of amend and, uh, and amendment to the Memorandum of Understanding on Infrastructure Funding Agreement uh, between WorkNet and uh, the Workforce Innovation Act Partners. Motion by Commissioner Long. Was it Commissioner Flowers on the second? Yes, okay. Commissioner Gerard. So there are no question, uh, no changes to this from the last one. Jennifer. Jennifer says no. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'd have to. I'll defer to Jennifer on this. No. I know we worked. <laughs> hmm? The other one was a lot of work, so I just wondered. Hi, Jennifer. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Thank you. And actually, this was a lot of work too, but oh, it's basically geez. just renewing the MOUs and IFAs for right. each of our required partners. And um, we just conducted an amendment and a renewal hmm. and changed the date. We put these on a one year with a three year renewal, and that aligns with the local workforce development board plan. Okay. Thanks. Just... Any other questions? Nope. All in favor say aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 25. Oh, yes, Commissioner Seal. Um, before we um, approve this, because it's the planning budget, um, under county administrator reports, we were going to have a career source Pinellas update. I'd rather have we that were. update before we approve their budget, okay. if that's possible. That's fine. We, yeah, we can move that. We'll move, seems it logical. After, we'll move it after, to after it when, when Barry's through. It's fine. Do you want to bring her up now or do it? Yeah. Okay. Do it now. Okay. Then Jennifer, come on up. Hmm. Wouldn't have had to go back. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I believe we had a PowerPoint presentation. I don't know if we want to do that now. Yeah, yeah, it's firing good. up right now. Yep. All right. There you go. Very good. Well, it's a pleasure to join you here today. We have a lot on the agenda that talks about Career Source Pinellas. To simplify things, what we've done is we've combined the quarterly report and the budget information for next program year. So today we will, oh, thank you. So today we will just talk about our financial planning. We'll talk about our um, program and operational updates. We'll also look at the compliance review, which I think there were some questions about that. We'll have some success stories and then we'll talk about our strategic plan. So we will begin with our financial planning. And this is our budget revenue for this year going into program year 21. Right now we have a projected planning budget of 
310, and that's compared to last year, which was just over 9.6 million, which is a decrease of about 460,000, or 4.8 percent. Most of the decrease is related to welfare transition and uh, SNAP funding and the completion of some special projects and timing of some grants that actually overlap multiple years. We owe us primary funding for um, Career Source Pinellas. This year we see, received about a 13 percent increase and we also have welfare transition funding, SNAP, employment services, and Wagner Pizer, Youth Build, and TAA, which is Trade Adjusted Assistance Act, which is basically dislocated worker funding. So all of that totals to our $9.2 million budget this year. Those are our revenue sources. We have our planned expenditures. The planned expenditures for next program year are focused on direct client services. Direct client services will make up about 89% of the budget. There's a little bug right there. And about 11% is planned toward administrative. The majority of our expenditures for PY21 will be in the areas of personnel expenses, work-based learning, customer training, supportive services, and we also have a contract with Pinellas Education Foundation which provides youth services to young adults 18 to 24. The remainder of the balance goes toward professional services, office equipment, occupancy, insurance, and other expenses which include travel, meeting, licenses, dues, supplies, outreach, and marketing. And we will continue to have a focus on the three areas that are important to the Department of Economic Opportunity. Those are providing scholarships to individuals who are receiving training with what we call ITA, individual training accounts, youth paid work experience, which is for young adults 18 to 24, and overall focus on uh, serving out of school youth at 70 percent. So that's really our planning for this next program year, which is PY 2021-22, 20, begins on July 1st and goes through June 30th. So any questions about our planning, revenue, and budget expenditures? We'll go ahead and go into our quarterly update. And here you will see that we have the uh, budgeted revenue, revenue of 9.6 million. Expenditures uh, right now, this was the end of February and that just our, our last uh, quarter. Expenditures were a little bit over 5.6 million and are focused again on direct client services. And direct client services make up about 89% and administration is about 11%. Primary funding sources remain the same. We owe a employment, um, employment services, which is Wagner, Pizer, SNAP, Welfare Transition, Youth Build, and TAA. And the majority of our expenses, uh, we'll go ahead, right here, are focused on personnel expenses, work-based learning, customer training, supportive services, and youth services provided through Pinellas Education Foundation. We also have expenses related to our traditional activities, professional services, office equipment, insurance, occupancy, and a few others. This year, as far as our goals related to ITAs or those individual training accounts, the goal was 30%. We blew that out of the water with 70%, which really I'm, I'm really proud about that. We are really putting people into training programs and it shows in this, in this uh, goal that we have. We also have our out-of-school youth. Our goal was to serve 70%. We've served 96%. And then we also will meet our, our goals related to paid work experience for young adults 18 to 24. We have our primary indicators. These are the goals established by USDOL through WIOA, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, and then negotiated with the Department of Economic Opportunity. Included in this screen are the current performance measures and the negotiated performance measures for PY 2020, 2021. Um, we are currently meeting exceeding all indicators except for the employed um, quarter after exit, second quarter after exit. And performance indicators that are part of the WIOA grant are what are called lagging indicators, which means these performances are actually based on individuals who exited the program last year. So 
if we look at individuals who exited the program last year in June of 2020, if we look at second quarter after exit is what's showing up here, which would be December of 2020, and it's indicating that they were not employed at that point in time. So obviously the pandemic has had an impact on these measures and on the employment of individuals who are participating in the program. We are reaching out to these individuals, providing services and helping them get back to employment. So hopefully when it gets to the fourth quarter after exit, those numbers are back up um, at least in the meeting criteria and that, that's our goal. We are talking with the Department of Economic Opportunity because we are not alone as a local workforce area in facing this challenge. This is something that has been experienced throughout the state of Florida through the pandemic at all 22 local workforce areas in, in one area or the other. We are closely monitoring, if we look at this year, the exits that will be happening in June. Those exits will impact our performance in December of 2021. There are several factors that impact the performance, including continuation of unemployment due to COVID, a change in policy from DEO that limits the time that is allowed for extending participation. So extending partic participation allows the organization to work with an individual until they find employment. The Department of Economic Opportunity has changed the policy and shortened that period of time. And then we are working to clean up from the previous administration and activities. And I'm hoping as we approach this program year, we will have all of that work through. Uh, we'll also talk about that with the compliance review, but 2021 is, is the goal to get that wrapped up and closed. So we will keep you posted on performance. And again, this is performance for this year and going into next program year. Our program 2021, uh, program update. First of all, I'm very proud of the team and what we've accomplished during this past year. It truly has not been an easy year. However, we've embraced our role as an essential service and through the entire pandemic, our doors remained open to the public. We did not close one day. We did implement safety protocols and move some of our services um, to a remote platform like workshops and, so, and some of the uh, counseling activities that we've had. But it was very important that we continue to provide public access to the Career Resource Center and the services that we offer at Career Source Pinellas. We did serve 3,608 individuals came through our Career Resource Center doors. Our remote traffic was way up. We had 13,883. We had 1,355 placements. We worked with 1,725 employers. We worked with 795 veterans, and we provided services to 589 individuals with special abilities. Talk a little bit about our organization. As an organization, we continue to evolve and focus on building organizational capacity. The organizational structure that we have in place now includes about 50 to 55 Career Source Pinellas employees and about 20 DEO state merit staff employees. The leadership team consists of four directors, two C level staff, a CFO, and a virtual part time CIO. We have a marketing specialist and an executive assistant. And as we move into next program year, we may be looking at adding a COO to the C-level team to help us raise the bar on the operational side of our business. We have spent a tremendous amount of time and effort building culture and employee engagement. As anyone knows who has dealt with an organization that has been through a major transition like CareerSource Pinellas has, that transition and culture and employee engagement takes time. We are very much focused on that. We are focused on reinforcing our company values. We've increased communication. We have a bi-weekly team happenings newsletter that goes out. We hold regular town hall meetings. I send an email out on a regular basis to all of our team members. And we have a workforce newsletter that really highlights some of the special activities and success stories that we have each month. We ask pulse questions for ongoing feedback on workplace culture. We conduct regular training, implemented an electronic enrollment process, and transitioned to a new 401k provider. And then there's the compliance review from USDOL. Well, it is still in process. 
As far as I know, DEO and DOL are still reviewing the information that we've provided to help resolve some of the findings that were outlined in that report. There will be a final report issued by US DOL, probably any time now. That report will identify which findings have been resolved and which ones have not, and any associated disallowed costs that might be a part of that activity. So at this point, all I can say is that stay tuned. <laughs> a lot of times these reports are released by DOL around the holiday. I don't know why they like to do that, but so 4th of July, but we'll, I don't have any definite time. Once that report is released, then we will begin the process of negotiating the, any disallowed costs that are associated with that activity. Commissioner Flowers has a question. Uh, we also have a couple of legislative updates. We have House Bill 1507, which was presented actually today to the governor for signature. This legislation will make a few adjustments oh, sorry, to, um, to the work that we do. It will reinforce the importance of working with education providers to provide training and upskilling. It adds some ter term limits to our board members that are part of the Career Source Pinellas Board. I believe they were looking at six years the last I, I reviewed this. And it will make some administrative changes to the subgrantee agreement. Once this is signed by the governor, governor, we will review everything, bring that back, take a look at our interlocal agreement and our bylaws and see what impact it has. It, it will most likely be administrative and uh, a real focus on working with our education providers, which I'm happy to say we have really good relationships and partnerships with our education providers. So we definitely agree with where this House bill is going. And then we also have WIOA reauthorization at the federal level. Again, not expecting any major changes. It seems to have bipartisan support. We'll focus more on partnering with education, providing training, and working on workforce development is, is really what the WIOA reauthorization will do. As we move forward, we will continue to focus on the reason why we were here, the people we serve. We highlighted four amazing individuals and their success stories in this presentation. And as we move forward, we will continue to focus on the strategic goals and mission established by the Board of Directors in 2019. Our mission is to build the talent pipeline for today and for the future by providing easy access to workforce solutions. And we have our strategic goals outlined in that strategic plan that was developed in 2009 as a collaborative effort with our workforce board. So this concludes the presentation that outlines our quarterly information and our budget for next program year. Lots going on. And I went through very quickly. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Flowers. I just wanted to, um, I missed the last meeting because we had our workshop. Yes. A budget workshop and I really thought I should be here since it was my first time going through that here but I just want to um, congratulate um, all the members of the board especially you and your staff you. um, we all know no need to rehash everything that they were going through but um, we have gotten a few updates or little trickle uh, pieces of information as FDOL right. has been reviewing the documents that have been submitted and thus far it's been very positive and mm -hmm. very affirming which attests to the thoroughness that you guys are giving right. um, not only in reviewing the previous administration's uh, work but then mm -hmm. correcting and right. doing what we need to do to go forward. Um, Barkley Har Harless is a wonderful okay. uh, chair of the board keeping us uh, focused and on, on point but um, I just wanted to give super kudos because it hasn't been easy I know and it yeah. was you know it's like swimming upstream with no yeah. paddle and no <laughs> propeller and and you're just trying to make sure that um, persons in our community receive the services that they need yeah. especially seeing all of the things that have happened as a result of COVID and how do we get those individuals retrained and retooled in other areas so they can become gainfully employed and continue on with their lives so I just wanted to share that with the group because I haven't given a workforce or career source I'm sorry board update since That's I've right. been on the board um, but I can tell you that each time um, that we've come together, the information has been very clear, very clean and thorough. And it's, it's a lot to say that FDOL is saying, okay, we're happy with this. A few more little pieces, nothing, you know, really that's been overbearing. So 
congratulations and thank yeah. you all so much for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I was just curious on the other side of our side of things, uh, what are we doing as a county um, to audit, monitor, review the happenings there so that we're in a position of knowing where we're at? Should you know, obviously we don't expect anything like that in the future, but we were kind of caught flat-footed when a few years ago. What are we doing as a county to make sure that we're not caught in that situation again? Yeah. And, and I think part of just me being here today is part of what we've agreed on, at least through the interlocal agreement, that I would provide quarterly updates. We have the board uh, meetings that he, happen every other month, and of course we always have a representative from the commission there. And then we provide regular updates to the, um, to the county as far as what we're doing and um, I, and the interlocal agreement and the bylaws are also a part of that activity and the 52 page sub grantee uh, agreement that's out there that outlines everything that we will do and that we will report back to the, the uh, county related to. I guess I'm thinking, I and mean, I appreciate that, I guess I'm thinking something more of an audit or review that's from, from our side because with all due respect, we get all these reports, we read them, just as we did before, and we believed everything we saw, and then, you know, so I guess that's where, and you don't have to answer, that's not for really for you, that's for us, okay. uh, to be thinking about how we handle it. Very good. Commissioner Gerard. Pull on out. <laughs> Commissioner Pete, right on. Flowers, you don't have to worry about giving a report. They heard enough reports from me in <laughs> a couple of years that I was on there. Um, I think we have, as a commission, changed the entire culture of the agency. You know, we're, we took control of the board appointments. We are there and engaged, and the board is engaged, uh, which it was not before. Um, it was snowed under, if you will. Um, and this, uh, certainly having Jennifer here giving reports and being available for questions, we weren't even getting budgets before. We, we had to beg for five item budgets and uh, now we get more information than we can prob <laughs> probably digest right. and I think that's important so yeah. I feel very confident with what's going on. Well, accessibility to you and to your team and accountability Absolutely. and uh, all that's going on is it makes a big difference and I think you touched on changing the culture Right. It doesn't happen overnight, but mm -hmm. it's certainly needed to happen overnight almost to get back on track. And yeah. so, um, you know, I think things are heading definitely where they need to be heading. So right. um, any other questions? Yes, Commissioner Long. I thought your report was uh, almost exhausting <laughs> to listen to compared. In a good way, she means. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I do sorry. mean that very affectionately <laughs> and in a good way compared to how hard, I mean, we couldn't even get somebody to show up back in the day. Mm -hmm. So thank you for being here. And uh, just refresh my memory and give us a little quick uh, tidbit, our status on where we are with the aquarium. It's, it, the, it's gone. The, everything the Science Center has been sold, everything has been taken care of and it's been finalized, so. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. And I, I thought that was the case, but there was a little thing in my head I, yeah. you know, everything. wanted to verify. Thank you. Everything exhausting. I was limited to only 10 slides. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it might have been worse. <laughs> Very well I appreciate done. that, though. You did great. Thank All you. Right. Thank the you. Science Center was sold to the city of St. Petersburg. Yeah. Yes. Oh, about damn time. And, and we did put everything from the Science Center. All of the proceeds went into the unrestricted funds just in anticipation of anything that may come from the USDOL report and that was based on uh, the Board of County Commissioner re recommendation and also a recommendation from our board. So, excellent. Okay, great. Um, then we'll back up to number item 25, which is the planning budget. Um, Move approval. And a second from Commissioner Gerard. Any questions on that planning budget? I mean, we certainly have gone through it a little bit here. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. Very good. good. Keep Thank up you. The, keep up the great work. All right. Thank you. Okay. County Attorney. So under 
Under item number 26, I am requesting uh, approval to uh, initiate litigation in the case that's referenced. This is a code enforcement action that uh, property that has a number of violations located in unincorporated Largo. Second. Did you get that, Kat? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Number tw item 20. <coughs> Anything else? Um, under redistricting, I did just want to bring to your attention, um, each of you will be getting contacted by the consultant if you have not already been. Uh, the consultant that is under contract with the county is Kurt Spitzer and Associates. Uh, Mr. Spitzer will be reaching out to you, more likely your aides, um, to try to arrange time to speak with each one of you. I know that was part of his plan, was to talk individually with each of you uh, in advance of the redistricting board being seated, just to talk with you all about your thoughts and, and ideas on the redistricting process. So that will be happening. I think he's trying to schedule those meetings sometime during the month of July. And then aside from that, we are still planning on bringing back your appointments to you on August the 10th. Okay. Any questions for the county attorney? Okay, thank you. Barry, back to you. Anything else under county administrator? No additional report. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're moving on to item 29, which is the appointment to the Tourist Development Council Board. Um, and I think if you look under, I guess, the ballot, we do have a ballot that uh, Kat's gonna pass out. Um, and maybe, uh, Jewel, just brief us again on column one, column two, three hotels versus four hotels. I think we have three now, and this is why we have an option to do either column one or column two. Thank you. It, it is, and I know there was a little bit of discussion last week as to whether some of the hotel hoteliers might fit both categories, and it's true, you know, depending on the operation that they run, they may. But I, what I would say is you do have three hoteliers on the council right now, so if you look at your ballot, that's why it is an either or option. You could choose somebody strictly from the hotel motel category, or you could choose somebody from the other category. Either way, your your minimum thresholds for membership are met. Okay. Um, it, Commissioner Peters, did you have a? I have two questions. So we're only picking one out of the four. Correct. That's correct. correct. Okay. And um, you know, we lost Tony Satterfield, who is from St. Pete Beach, um, and I know Clyde Smith. Personally, he's an amazing man uh, who's done so much for the community. Um, not only is he a general manager of a hotel, but he's also an investor in the same hotel, so he's, he's got ownership. But, um, but since we lost Tony and he was South County, I'd like to see us kind of keep that balanced right now. It's pretty balanced as far as North County and South County. Um, and so I really think Clyde would be a great, I'm just advocating for him, I think he'd be a great, great uh, representative in Tony's place. Any, any other comments on that? Um, when you have your ballot, uh, you can go ahead and cast your vote and Kat will pick them up from us. While she's uh, uh, doing that, um, any county commission report? Does anybody want to bring anything up of, of the good of the commissioner seal? I'll just give my report on Forward Pinellas. Um, we met here and had a power outage, and so we actually met in the lobby and just took care of necessary business. One was adopting the fiscal year 20. 122 to 2526 transportation improvement program, continued advocacy for full funding, um, um, including the West Shore Interchange in Tampa and I-275 corridor improvements under Tampa Bay Next. Um, we, within the transportation plan, it does have funding for the roundabout at Palm Harbor Boulevard and Florida Avenue, intersection improvements at Alt 19 at Curlew, um, reconstruction of Gandhi from 4th Street to west of Gandhi Bridge, State Road 60 pedestrian overpass, Pinellas Trail Loop, Drew Street improvements, and capital funding for PSTA bus replacements. Um, 
Secretary Gwen also provided a quick update on federal um, that there may be additional projects that can come back into the five-year work plan because of um, possible federal funding. And then the only other action we took was we approved the amendments to the countywide rules, which creates the senior housing bonus and revised and clarified process for countywide plan map adjustments. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Commissioner Justice. To, uh, uh, we have our golf consortium uh, meeting next week in Orange County, and um, that's we continue to adjust projects on our statewide list of projects as counties get through them. But um, relatively brief meeting is scheduled for next week. And then I just want to send our condolences and our thoughts to our colleagues across the Bay in Manatee County who lost two employees this week uh, to COVID. Two in the same department, and three in that same department were hospitalized as well. Uh, beyond those two, so. To the families of uh, Mr. Cox and Ms. Knight, just our condolences. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Long. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to share that the next board meeting of TBARDA is not until July 16th. PSTA, for those of us that sit on that, meets tomorrow at 9 a.m. And the I know uh, I've said it before, you'll hear me say it quite often, the climate summit for the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council is now set for January 27th and 28th of 2022 at the Hilton Carillon. More information to come on that. Um, if you're interested at our next meeting, it'd be great if we could see the video that they presented to us at our last board meeting called Project Phoenix, which is a simulation of a cat five hurricane that might hit Tampa Bay. Uh, they showed it to us. It was just staggering to watch it. And I want to wish everybody who might be listening a happy 4th of July. Be safe. That's okay. it, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I just had a couple things real quickly. Just uh, on Tampa Bay Water, we uh, approved our budget for the coming year. It's like a 0.17 percent, so it's less than a half a penny increase in our water, um, our, 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 our rate there, which is uh, very small, but just trying to keep up with the capital requirements that are coming. I don't think it's passing through and as any increase in our water rates because of that here locally in Pinellas County. Um, we talked, uh, had some really great presentations on South, South Hillsborough County, a memorandum of understanding. We talked about the well field issues down in South County, uh, South Hillsborough County, and, um, and talked about swapping some land for, for some available, available project uh, well field development down there. Uh, a, a really robust construction update on all the projects that were going on. And then, you know, proudly we gave a great Pinellas County uh, presentation as to, and did a SWOT analysis of our county as it relates to water resources. I think I, Kim sent that to everybody. I hope you had a chance to look at it. Uh, Megan did a great presentation. Her team put together a really nice report. We're going first, and then all of the member governments are getting opportunities to speak before our board, and that's one of the things that trying to work out better communication between our member governments is having access to the board and everybody's it's, it's really going well so i was glad she did a great job and i think it'll be a good uh, a good um lead, you know good example for others to follow so um a really good good meeting and um now we we've approved all of the work that needs to be done to put the hiring for our general manager the new general manager so that's going to start today that search for the new general manager for Tampa Bay Water. So wanted everybody to be up to speed on that. Um, I'm assuming when I'm, I'm about, to, I'm gonna assign a, a resident to the canvassing board for the August elections. Um, and I, I, when I say that, I'm assuming that nobody here is available. And I just double checking that before I make that, that people have gotten into committing their endorsements elsewhere. I just want to make sure I'm clear. So um, that being the case, I'm going to move forward and and put and, and uh, assign Herb Polson, who has done it before. He's stepped up again and he's willing to serve. And that will be for the August election. And I'll get back to you as far as November later. 
okay? Um, and uh, last thing that we, we discussed at the workshop that we would be moving our Board of County Commission meetings back to the Court Street, the courthouse, uh, on the fifth floor, 315 Court Street, um, in August, the first meeting in August. We'll continue to do the workshops here. We're working on another solution that hasn't come to pass yet, but right now we'll continue working, doing our workshops here, at least for the foreseeable future. But uh, starting in August, we will be doing our meetings at the courthouse back in the chambers. Um, and uh, the only other thing I wanted to ask again, I think we've kind of talked about this before, about continuing to allow Zoom um, folks from our residents to call in um, under the Zoom application for meetings going forward, provided that they sign up the day before by five o'clock. That's the way we've been doing it. And um, so um, I just wanna make sure that's the direction that I'm going unless I hear pushback from four of you uh, to open it up to keep our residents engaged with us. So at this point, we will continue having that Zoom availability to our residents. Okay. And finally, just to echo Commissioner Long's comment, happy fourth to all of you. I know that there are some cities. I met with um, city managers from North County and there's, um, there, there are mayors this morning that are having fireworks so that those are starting back up in a couple cities. Please be careful as you enjoy those or the parades or any activities with your families. Um, and happy fourth to everybody. And with that said, uh, our meeting up, oh, Commissioner Flowers. I just want to say thank you to everybody who chipped in and provided some uh, flowers for former Mayor Bill Foster's mom. As soon as you walked in the door at the service, they were right there. I took a picture and mm -hmm. I meant to send it so all of you all could see it, but he was extremely touched. He and Wendy, um, uh, Christina and Billy Jr. and everybody were very touched by the overture. So thank you yeah. all so very much. Yeah. It was and, a beautiful service. Thank you for saying that. And again, those were those are individual <laughs> commissioner contributions. It's not, yes. It's not tax dollars. So exactly. we're individually doing that. So I just want to make that clear clarification. Um, and uh, anything else? All right. We are adjourned and we'll be back at six o'clock for our public you, hearing. Mr. Chair, uh, do you want to hear the TDC appointment? Oh, oh yeah, that's kind of, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna let you do it at six o'clock, but um, the, for the Tourist Development Council, uh, they appointed Clyde Smith was, okay. was the victor. Okay, well, that, victor. he'll be a good addition to the team. There was, there was actually four really good members that were, that were brought, that, that applied, so. All right, so we'll come back, start at six o'clock uh, with a report from, uh, I think our Youth Advisory Committee, and then we also have, um, one, two, three, four cases. See you at six.